of the regular season series between arch rivals Toronto and Hamilton gets the Harold Ballard Trophy. Round one, the season opener for both clubs, goes to the Argonauts by a single point. Round two, the Argos clinch the trophy. It's close again. This time they win by two. But the Tiger Cats come back to win round three, this time at home in convincing fashion and just before the playoffs. But do their regular season meetings mean anything now? The answer from both coaches, Bob Belovich and Al Bruno, is no. Those games are played at different times, often with different personnel, under very different circumstances. So the Ballard Trophy is history now. It's the Grey Cup. These clubs are eyeing, and the road to Vancouver begins this afternoon. For either the Toronto Argonauts, the first-place finishers in the CFL East, or the two-time defending Eastern champion, Hamilton Tiger Cats. Live from Iverwind Stadium in Hamilton. Game one of the two-game Eastern Final on CTV. The Tabbies closed out the regular season last Friday, home to Ottawa, and they had their hands full. But they eked out a one-point victory as Paulus Ballston comes through in the dying seconds with this field goal. The Tiger Cats win for the third consecutive time. The Argonauts come to today's game on a win streak of their own. They took back-to-back -back games from Montreal. Last Sunday at the Big O, J.C. Watts gets the Argonauts offense on track as he finds Daryl Smith for a 34-yard gain. That sets up a William Miller touchdown. And in the third quarter, the Argos pour it on. Paul Pearson works himself all alone. Watts finds him. It's a 25-yard major, a 37-16 tune-up for the playoffs. And the win was handy for the Argonauts in that it pushed them back into first place in the East. A slim one point ahead of Hamilton, so they will have home field advantage for the second half of this two-game series. And so today, the Eastern playoffs start in Hamilton. Game one of a total point series between the Argonauts and the Tiger Cats. Just about perfect weather conditions today. A little cloudy, it is cool, and just a light breeze, though we may get a flurry this afternoon. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to the CFL on CTV. You can tell it's the playoffs here at Ivor Wynn. There's that extra excitement in the crowd. The players are pumped up. And with these two teams being longtime rivals and reasonably well-matched, we expect a whale of a ball game today. I think very physical, lots of hard hitting. For their comments, let's go up to the broadcast booth. Pat Marsden standing by with Leif Pedersen. Thank you, Dan. Hello again, everybody. You talk about the excitement. It's here because the Argos definitely have a chance to win this game. Hamilton is favored to win this game. And, Leaf, I think you flip a coin. Well, I think you really do, Pat. You know, it comes down to the issue at this time of the year. Who can protect their quarterback better? The Argonauts have had an awful time this year with the sacks. If Hamilton gets after J.C. Watts early, it could be a long day. If they give him protection, you never know. Well, as a matter of fact, Argos give up more than five sacks a game, and they're playing one of the toughest defenses, so if the Argos haven't corrected that, it could be game over. Anyway, right now, we want to meet these players. Dan Matheson is standing by. Thank you, gentlemen. That's it for us to talk about today's game. Now let's meet the combatants for the first game of the Eastern Final. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Iverwind Stadium. This is the Hamilton Tiger Cats. the Toronto Argonauts in game one of the Eastern Final. Introducing the starting offensive lineup for the Toronto Argonauts. At center, wearing number 51, Mark Napolitan. Number 69, Dan Barone. At right guard, wearing number 68, Dave Kersinger. At left tackle, wearing number 64, Chris Schultz. Rowing number 66, Kelvin Brunster. At wing back, running number 25, Paul Pearson. At wing
running back, wearing number 74, Daryl Smith. And running back, wearing number 20, Cedric Minter. At fullback, wearing number 37, Warren Hudson. Receiver wearing number nine, Keith Baker. At wide receiver wearing number 85, Chris Woods. And the quarterback wearing number six, J.C. Watts. saw a classic example of how these two teams are very different. The Argonauts organized and meticulous. They pay attention to detail. The Tiger Cats come out en masse and will attack in a pack. The opening kickoff in just a moment. The CFL playoffs on CTV. Stadium at Hamilton this afternoon. Their Thai Cats had a terrific second half. There is a look at Bobby Bryan, who will be the referee this afternoon, and the rest of the people who will work with him. The Toronto Argonauts, who lost only one game to Eastern opposition this year, they were eight and one, 
the only loss coming here at Ivor Wynn Stadium three weeks ago. So it's going to be very interesting to see just what transpires here in the first half of this home and home series. Dwight Edwards, number 30. Chris Woods, number 85, are back deep to return the kickoff by this man, Paul Osbaldiston, who came on to play for the Ticats when Bernie Ruoff was injured. This will be Edwards from his 25. Edwards struggles to the 40-yard line, brought down there by Ralph Schultz, number 67. So the Toronto Argonauts are going to begin this first series of offensive plays from good field position. J.C. Watts must have the big game, but Cedric Miller is the surprise starter because Willie Miller came down with the flu this past week. Ben, I think really having Keith Baker back in the lineup, of course he played against Montreal last week, I think that's got to help this receiving core. He's a super receiver, runs great routes, and I think he can help out J.C. Watts. J.C. is going to put it up. Or at least he wanted to put it up, but Mitchell Price finally chased him down out of bounds for a loss of a couple of yards. Now, the Argos know that their real Achilles heel is the fact they have not been able to protect the quarterback. And because the secondary did a good job there, there was nobody open for J.C. to throw to. Well, Pat, you make an excellent point. That, of course, really has been their problem. But this group right here, these starting five offensive linemen, that's the best offensive line they've had all season long. If these guys can't get the job done against this front four, then they have no chance. It's second down, about 12 yards to go. J.C. Watts going deep, looking for Smith, and it's over his head. So the Ticats did exactly what they wanted to do. Mark Streeter covered Daryl Smith all the way down the field, but the Cats did exactly what they wanted to do. Shut down the Argos early. There's an intimidating factor there, of course, and then hopefully move the ball themselves when they get it back. Well, the luxury that the Ticats really have is not only do they have an excellent front four and good linebackers, and when they blitz, they've got an excellent group in the secondary. You saw good coverage, one-on-one -on -one Mark Streeter, and that's a real luxury they have. This is Paul Bennett taking Hank Olisic's punt and getting it out to about the 38-yard line. So now let's take a look at that Hamilton Ticat offensive alignment, and they have a fellow at quarterback that I think is going to be a star in this league for many years to come in Mike Kerrigan, who spent three years with the New England Patriots and has really come on in these last few games. Of course, a couple of receivers, Tony Champion and Rocky DiPietro, both over 1,000 yards in receiving this year, so they've got a pretty good group there. Kerrigan looks. He's got Wayne Lee. Lee has the ball at the Toronto 38-yard line, brought down by Daryl Moyer. When you look at Mike Kerrigan, you're looking at the classic drop-back passer. He completes for 34 yards to Wayne Lee on his first pass of the ball game. Well, you know, he's six foot four and he can stand tall in that pocket. He's got a great sight line to all his receivers and what a great way to start the ball game off. Wayne Lee was getting a chance to play this year. Had 46 catches and makes a big one to get them started. The 34-yard game gives Hamilton first down at the Toronto 38-yard line. This is their new running back, Ken Zachary. Zachary does a good job to get inside the 35 to about the 32-yard line as the big fella from Oklahoma State picks up six yards. Gerald Bayless, 99, and David Marshall, 73, the middle linebacker, combined on the tackle. You know, I can remember over the last five years, this was one area that was really a concern area for the Ticats. But this year, they've only allowed 58 sacks. That's third in the league. Miles Correll, of course, he's the offensive line nominee for the Shenleys in the East, so they've, been, they've done a good job. On second and four, Kerrigan throws complete to Rocky DiPietro. And the Rock has a first down at the 25, where Daryl Wilson fills the feet out from under. Well, excellent play selection by Mike Kerrigan. When you've got a six foot three inside receiver like Rocky DiPietro, and you only need three, four yards to pick up the first down, run that flat pass. He'll make the catch. He can fall for a first down. Smart play. Rocky, a Shenley Award finalist in the Canadian category against Joe Poplowski, didn't play all year and still caught 86 passes for the Ticats. First down, Hamilton, the ball at the Toronto 26. Carrigan unloads and right into the hands of Willie Pless. Willie Pless 
makes the big play for the Argos, as he has done in every game in which he's played. That's why he's the Eastern nominee for the Shenley Rookie of the Year Award. Well, he's just had a super rookie year. Had three interceptions on the season, and this is definitely a ball Mike Kerrigan should have not have thrown. He was getting pressure, shouldn't have thrown it, plus makes the big play. It's a 36-yard interception, and we'll see what the Argos can do when we come back. It is scoreless, and we will return in a moment. At least temporarily, Willie Pless, who stepped in front of that pass that Mike Kerrigan probably wishes now he hadn't thrown, and Toronto has possession of the ball at their 48-yard line with a first down. Highcats had 77 sacks in 1986, but this time it is Cedric Minter. And Minter will get about eight yards, forced out by Howard Fields. This is what the Argos must do this afternoon. Run the football, and they hope with the newcomer, Mark Napolitan at center, that they'll better be able to do that. Well, I think that's an excellent point, Pat, because in the three games that these teams have played this year, and that's how you have to look at this series now, how they did against each other during the season, the Argos only had about 50 yards a game rushing, and you just can't do that. It's too easy for the defense. They give to Minter again, but there is no way that he could get by Frank Robinson, who appears to have stopped him short of the first down. Well, there's no question they'll call for a measurement here. Very close, but, you know, when you're only rushing the ball 50 yards a game, those defensive linemen, they just tee off and come, you know. There's no fear of trap blocks or anything like that, and I couldn't agree with you more. If they can establish some kind of running game just to slow them down. They are inches short, and to me, Argos must go for it here. I mean, you've got to establish, A, that you're not intimidated by the defense, and B, that in fact you have confidence in somebody like a Cedric Minter, or if you decide to go to the fullback, Warren Hudson, or in fact, J.C. Watts just keeps it himself. Well, the new center, Mark Napolitan, you talked about. He's six foot three, 260 pounds, with the defense giving a yard off the line of ball. If I'm J.C. Watts, I just tuck right in behind his fanny and pick it up. And Watts does that, and he should have the first down. He just took one step to the right, picks up the first down, as signaled by referee Bob Bryan of Ottawa, and the Argos get their first first down of the ball game. You might mention the one major change that the Thai Cats had to make for this game was Les Brown's knee injury did not heal properly. Jim Rockford is playing the corner. He's number 26 today, and don't be surprised if Argonauts test him. Well, he's out there right now with Keith Baker. This would be as good a time as any to throw it to him. Let's see what he can do. Instead, they go over the middle, and it's knocked away. Leo Esrins and Howard Fields both came across. Well, that's the great thing about that Ticat linebacking core. Leo Esrins, Ben Zambiazzi, and Frank Robinson, they've all got great mobility and range. And that time, Leo Esrins came a long way, but at six foot four, you know, he's got the long arms. He can get up and knock those balls down. So it'll bring up a second and ten for the Argos. They are in Hamilton territory at the Ticat 52 yard line. Watts will be short of the first down. Rod Skillman is there to make the stop for Hamilton, number 59. Watts, look, look, and let's give the Argo offensive line credit. They did a good job. It was simply that the secondary had everybody covered. Well, last time on second and long, the Ticats blitzed. This time, they just rushed four people, dropped everybody off the line of scrimmage, and they got some pretty good coverage downfield. There's Chris Woods. It's tough if you can't even get off the line of scrimmage, and Jim Rockford, the newcomer, did a good job. That's legal. You can give him one shot. Here's the best punter in the CFL in 1986, averaging 48 and a half yards a punt. Hank Olesic angles it toward the hash mark taken there by Wayne Lee. And Dan Rasevich, as he so frequently is, was first downfield. A 41-yard punt, a five-yard return. It's still scoreless. We'll be back in a moment. Conditions near perfect here today. Just a little bit of a breeze. The turf is dry at the moment. The snow so far has held off. And I think we've answered one question already. The coaches were a little concerned about maybe the intensity level today since it's a two-game series. But the hitting we've seen so far, Patrick, I think they're up for this one. Boy, Dan, I couldn't agree with you more. They are rocking and socking out there as the Ticats start in a hole at their 10-yard line. First down. 
give us to Zachary. And there isn't much there. Zachary gets a couple of yards, maybe. David Marshall, the middle linebacker, stuck his nose in there. He's had a tremendous season for the Argos as Ken Zachary gets to about the 12 and a half yard line. Uh, Mark Seal, also number 76, just stood Dale Sanderson, the right guard, right up, and he plugged up the hole and allowed Marshall to make the tackle. That's what you like, though. Your defensive linemen stuff it up and let the linebackers make all the hits. And this is what the Argos like now. Kerrigan has to put it up. Second down, about seven yards to go. Kerrigan looking. Fires to the back, out of the backfield. Zachary, and he fights his way over the 20 to the 21 yard line and he may well have that first down because of that last little second effort. Well Willie Pless came up and made the play. He dropped off from his coverage and came up to make the hit but when you've got a 229 pound back like Ken Zachary sometimes you can't stop him dead in his tracks and those extra couple of steps picked up the first down. That's great effort. It is terrific effort for Ken Zachary and the Hamilton Ticats who now have it at their 21 first down. The pass is complete to the 48-yard line. Steve Stapler gathers in. Mike Kerrigan's pass has the big first down of 27 yards. Well, the Toronto Argonauts were in a zone coverage, and once Kerrigan breaks the pocket, now the fun starts. Everybody starts running around, and Stapler found a little open seam, got in behind Daryl Boyer, and that's a big gain. You know, back-to-back -back first downs, you start on your own 10-yard line. You want to get it out of your own territory. They've done a great job. They have it now at about their own 49-yard line. First down, Hamilton. This is Zachary again. This time, though, he's nailed for a loss of about a yard. Well, that's the thing now, though, Pat. You've got some breathing room. Get those back-to-back -back first downs. Now, you know, if your drive stalls, it's, it's not a big deal. You can punt it away, and you've, you've got back that field position. In a playoff game, any time. Field position dictates so much of what you can do offensively. So it'll be second down and just a little more than 10 yards to go for the first down. <laughs> Kerrigan over the middle to Wayne Lee. And Lee will be close. The stop is made by Cliff Hewitt, the inside safety number 15. Now, this could be decision time for Al Bruno, but with less than a yard, you could almost count that he's going to go for it. Well, they're going to test number 15, Cliff Hewitt. A blitzing situation, one on one with a slot back going across the field. It's tough to stay with him. He did a good job, and I think he made a good tackle to keep him short. And as Lee pointed out, they are short by about a foot and a half. The ball is in. Toronto Territory as you take a look at Bob Obilovich head coach for five years of the Argos four first place finishes he took over a club that was in the basement brought them to the top and then for the second time in his five year career he has moved the Argos from the bottom to the top because of course last year they finished dead last so it is third and inches Kerrigan keeps it himself he has the first down as he reaches the Toronto 50-yard line. Nice to have a quarterback who's 6'4", 215 pounds when you only need a few inches to pick up a first down. Well, I went down and watched him in his pregame warm-up. He is absolutely the classic drop-back uh, passer. He sets up so perfectly. And I ran into Ronnie Lancaster, who should know a little bit about that. He said, yeah, he is unquestionably textbook style. Yeah, he is. And you know what I like? Everybody was out in the warm-up, all bundled up with the cold. He was out in a T-shirt. <laughs> Those are the kind of guys you like oh, to play for. Absolutely. Carrigan again to his release man, Wayne Lee. And Lee, showing real good effort, gets to the 41-yard line where Marlon Jones, the defensive end, was there to bring him down. You know, I talked about Wayne Lee earlier and his contribution to the Thai Cats this year. You know, he's played for four years. In his first three years, he only caught a total of 32 balls. This year, in 1986, he's got 46, so he surpassed what he's done in three years. He's caught three balls early, already in this first quarter, and, boy, he opened up the game with a nice long pass. And he comes up just short of the first down, so it'll be second 
And about a foot and a half to go for the first down for Hamilton. You know, he's originally a defensive back in university, and I, I have to believe that that helps you read the zones a little bit. I think that's an excellent point, Lee. Kerrigan has been good on six of seven passes for 96 yards, and what a string he's put together here. Keeps it himself and has another Hamilton first down as he crosses the 40 into about the 39-yard line of the Argonauts. But you make a valid point, too, as we take a look at Al Bruno trying for his third Eastern Conference championship in succession. When you have a guy the size of Mike Kerrigan, there are a lot of things you can do on third, on second down and short yardage. You can throw the ball, but you know you've got the first down within. Well, Mike Kerrigan, he spent three years with the New England Patriots. Of course, did not see a lot of playing time, but I'm sure under Steve Grogan down there, who was the starting quarterback, he had to learn quite a bit about offense. His pass is complete to Tony Champion. And Champion has the first down. A flag will come down. He'll have a face mask call against Kerry Parker. It was a little deep by Champion to get by Parker. And as he did so, Parker reached up, grabbed him by the face mask. And this will be much more than a first down. Well, once again, he's working on Kerry Parker. Kerry Parker said in the paper this week, in the last game against Hamilton, I was burned twice by Tony Champion. I was too aggressive. I tried to overplay him. Well, this time he said, I'm going to lay off a little more. He laid off him there, and that was an easy out and catch. And with the penalty tacked on, the ball now comes to the 13-yard line of the Argos. It is first down, Hamilton. Don't forget, this drive started on Hamilton's 10-yard line. It has been an impressive one. Kerrigan to the end zone. Touchdown, Tony Champion. Beautiful drive, great play selection, terrific execution, and it culminates in a picture-perfect pass from quarterback Mike Kerrigan to that man, Tony Champion, the speedster, formerly with the Dallas Cowboys. Well, in the three meetings this year between the Ticats and Argos, he was their leading receiver, so why not go to him in a crit critical situation? Osbaldiston is good, as he has been on every attempt this year. And the Ticats have gone out in front 7 and nothing. Let's look at it one more time, Lee. Well, Pat, they were trying to protect the cornerback, Kerry Parker. He rolled up in a, what we call a cloud zone coverage to try and bump Tony Champion. He got inside, broke to the corner. There was no help from the inside safety, Darrell Wilson, and that's an easy touchdown. The Ticats lead the Argos 7 and nothing. We'll be back with the Hamilton kickoff in just a moment. Tony Champion in his pregame warm-up. He looks like a racehorse. He has those great legs. Speed to burn as Osbaldiston gets the kickoff away to Dwight Edwards at his 24. Well, Edwards did a good job to get out over the 40-yard line because it looked like he was going to be wrapped up back about the 30. But this is the dimension that he has added to Toronto since coming two weeks ago to the club. We'll talk about Tony Champion. He's 6'1", 175 pounds, a slender guy, but as you said, a real speedster. And, you know, you hate the playoff game to have a breakdown in coverage, but that's exactly what happened. And the last time these two teams met, a breakdown in coverage cost them a touchdown with Tony Champion. So the Argos begin from their 42-yard line. Chris Woods. And Woods gets out over the 50 to about the 51-yard line. Frank Robinson along with Paul Bennett there to bring him down. Well, that's a favorite play in the Argonaut scheme of things, that quick screen to the wide receiver, Chris Woods. You talk about blinding speed. This fellow sure has it. Over 1,000 yards in receptions. I'm, not, I'm surprised they haven't gone against Jim Rockford early to test him out, though. Well, that's a point well made. On second down, a yard to go. This is Cedric Mitter, and Mitter has the first down for Toronto into Hamilton territory at the 53, where he runs into 31, Ben Zambiazzi, and 43, Frank Robinson. Of course, Cedric Minner missing the last three games with a hamstring injury. William Miller was scheduled to play in this game, but he came down with the flu this week, could not practice. So, of course, Cedric Minner, lucky to have him in the lineup. 
J.C. Watts has completed one of three passes prior to this one to Keith Baker. And that was exactly the same play to the other side of the field, the Baker that they tried with Chris Woods. Grover Covington brings him down at the 45-yard line. It'll be a pickup of eight. Well, if the Tiger Cat cornerbacks are going to lay off like that, I think they should just keep running that play. The key is to get the first block on the corner. Paul Pearson twice in a row has made excellent blocks. J.C. Watts is the starter, but no guarantee that he'll be the finisher. Holloway is available if needed. This is Warren Hudson, and the big fullback was looking for the first down. He appears to be just a little bit short, but it'll be a situation where the Argos can go for it on third down if, in fact, he is short. Mike Walker, 61, who had such an outstanding season in sacking quarterbacks. He had 21 of them. And Grover Covington, 77, were there to make the stop. short by about an inch so this is a snap or it should be anyway for J.C. Well, the nice thing that they've been able to do on this drive on their first first down and now of course in the second opportunity they've got good yardage on first down with those two quick screens to the wide receivers they picked up eight yards a pop you know and boy, it, it simplifies the game for you so much when you can do that third and inches J.C. keeps it himself he makes it, but he's lucky that it wasn't a yard and inches to go because they, they did stop him, but he did pick up the necessary inches. You know where he went behind, too. Big <laughs> number Schultz. 64, Chris Schultz, 6'9", 275, and I think that's a pretty good choice. Yeah, I'd be inclined to go behind somebody 6'9". <laughs> sure. As well. You know, I, it's beyond me, but there has been criticism of Bob Obilovich, even some people suggesting that he should be replaced. Now, the guy has finished first four out of five years. The Argos hadn't been in a Grey Cup for 30-some years. He took them there his very first year, and the second year he won the Grey Cup, and now they're calling for a scalp. If that makes sense, I wish somebody would explain it to me. First down, Toronto. The ball is up to Hamilton, 43. pass off the hands of Keith Baker but I'll tell you he had a lot of time and there was a good job done on Grover Covington well, Chris Schultz is doing an excellent job on Covington but here's Keith, Keith Baker they're protecting Jim Rockford they rolled him up and now Mark Streeter picks him up deep he does a good job to stay with him but I think Keith Baker should have made this catch you know he does have good hands but you know when you jump in the air maybe you think you're going to get your legs cut out from underneath you and sometimes that makes you a little edgy but he should have made that catch. It's second and ten Argos. Safety blitz. And the pass is off the hands of Daryl Smith. You know what, Pat? These Argonaut receivers are being intimidated. You know, he could have made that catch. Baker could have made the last catch. You know, they're looking around, waiting to get hit. It's a simple fact of intimidation. You see Howard Fields there. I know he's talking to them. I played with him. He's saying, you're not going to catch a ball on me all day. These guys are intimidated. Watch this. A good throw by J.C. Watts. The safety blitz coming, and I think he kind of went up half-hearted for that one. So it brings Hank Kalisic in for his third punt of the ball game. He angles it towards Paul Bennett, and Bennett makes the catch and steps out of bounds at the four. What a great punt by Hank Olisic, because now the Tie Cats are hemmed in once again. A 39-yard boot with no return. You know, I talked to Art Aselta, who's the Argonaut offensive coordinator before the game, and one of the things that they were really disappointed in the last time they were here at Iverwin was Hank Olisic's kicking, because although he kicked for a great average and got some single points, they wanted him to kick out of bounds and pin Hamilton in deep. He's been able to do that twice already today. However, the last time the Argo defense couldn't do anything to stop the Hamilton Ticats who marched 100 yards in 10 plays for the only touchdown of the ball game. This is Zachary who was very nearly nailed for a safety touch by Gerald Bayless. He slipped out of Bayless's grasp and got to the one yard line. But boy, oh boy, there was great penetration by Bayless as the first quarter rapidly comes to an end. It is Hamilton 7, 
Toronto nothing. We'll return with the second quarter in a moment. What a terrific first quarter. The Hamilton Ticats lead the Argos 7 to nothing, but the Ticats in a real jackpot now. Second and 12 back at their two yard line. Kerrigan fires and out of bounds. Steve Stapler couldn't catch up with the ball, but even had he, it would have been out of bounds. Let's take a look at what happened statistically in that first quarter. Well, that's and show. much of the yardage will show that the Ticats had that one great march of 100 yards, 135 to 40. The only turnover was that pass interception by Willie Pless. You know, this is the one thing I don't like about having your wide receiver be your punter. Now, Steve Stapler just ran about a 40-yard pass pattern. He's got to come back. He's got to be a little tired after that. Now he's got to kick you out of trouble. I don't know. Yeah, and he's a slow punter, too. I imagine they're going to come right after this one. Well, he got good protection. He sends this one high. Not that deep, though. Brazley at the 34-yard line. And he doesn't get much, but he hangs on to the football at the 33. Ed Gattavakis is down quickly to make the stop. 33 yards the punt, two yards the return, but the Argos, because of their defensive unit, are in good shape. The Western Final, the BC Lions against either the Edmonton Eskimos or the Calgary Stampeders, we'll know later this afternoon, comes to you here on CTV next Sunday afternoon at 4.30. The winner of that ball game will go to the Grey Cup representing the Western Conference. J.C. Watts with that hit screen again to Chris Woods. Look at the gate on this man. He crosses the 20 into the 19. It's a Toronto first down. Lance Shields, along with Paul Bennett, were there to make, make the stop for Hamilton, but it's a 15-yard pickup for Chris Woods. Well, they're getting the key initial block that time. Once again, 25 Paul Pearson. You know he's a great receiver, but he's doing a great job blocking. He gets enough of a piece of Howard Fields. There you see it. And that allows the speed of Chris Woods just to keep going upfield. Good blocking. Watts pass was very nearly picked off by the newcomer, Jim Rockford, but the ball went right through his hands. Now, I mean, I don't care if Rockford's as slow as I am. He's going to go the other way for a touchdown because nobody but nobody was in front of him. He's fortunate that he did get his hand on the ball, though, because Baker was in behind him. Well, there's definitely miscommunication here between quarterback and receiver. The Argonauts are very fortunate. Ball is at the Hamilton 19, where it is second down, 10 yards to go, Toronto. Watts for Daryl Smith, nowhere near him. Well, in the three meetings between these clubs, the Hamilton quarterbacks passed for just over 60%, and the Toronto Argonauts passed for under 50%, and that is holding true here this afternoon. As Lance Chomick, who set an Argonaut field goal record in this 1986 season, he kicked 37 of them, and that beats Zen and Andrew Sisson's record of 32, is on to try a 26-yarder. 37 of 48 on the year. And that one is good. I mean, it went, it went like a rifle shot. No height at all, and it just cleared the crossbar. As the Argos hit the scoreboard, but the Ticats continue to lead it. Hamilton 7, Toronto 3. We'll be back in a moment. From Tire Cats leading this game 7-3, interesting talking to the players. They say from both teams, neither club is doing anything at all different today. No new formations, no trick plays, but players from both teams are expecting wrinkles at any moment. They think somebody's going to come up with a surprise soon. I'll tell you, Dan, what the Argos are doing differently is they're protecting their quarterback. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to throw the ball very well, and I would think if he doesn't pick it up shortly, Codridge Holloway is going to see some action. Hamilton starts at their 35-yard line. Kerrigan unloads to Jed Tommy, and Tommy is wrapped up by well, Don Moan, number 36. Well, nope. just when it looked like Kerrigan was going to be sacked, he got it away to Tommy, who only picks up a couple of yards, but it's better than losing. It's interesting how this game has progressed so far. The Argonaut offensive line's done an excellent job protecting J.C. Watson. The Toronto Argonaut front four, who normally are not a good sacking group, have put some pretty good pressure at times on Mike Kerrigan.
Kerrigan fires across the middle to Rocky Di Pietro. Willie Pless wraps him up. There is a penalty marker down in the Toronto secondary. Usually indicates some form of interference. I couldn't really see what was being called or who Wonderful. collided with who. Well, let's see. Here it is. Holding Toronto number 15. Number 15, Cliff Hewitt is called for holding, so he obviously grabbed a receiver who was going to just slip by him. Well, it's interesting. Cliff Hewitt was quoted in the Toronto papers this week as talking about Rocky DiPietro. He said he's a physical receiver. Well, you sure don't hear that too often. A defensive back talking about a receiver and saying he's physical. You know, you always say, well, the guy's faster. He's got great hands, but... Rocky Di Pietro certainly is a physical kind of guy. 6'3, about 215, and he likes to go down and push off people. So the penalty gives Hamilton a first down just inside their 47 yard line. There's the screen to Tony Champion. And Champion's very close to another first down. He was able to evade the tackle by Hewitt. And then Carl Braisley finally did make the stop. But it's a first down because of the speed of that man, Tony Champion. Tony Champion, look at those black things on his arms and the gloves he's wearing. Those are the new skin diver kind of gloves that the receivers are wearing. It's a soft kind of rubber that really gives good traction on the football, and he laces a piece of it all the way up his arms, so when he's carrying the ball, there's less chance of fumbling it. So it is first down, Hamilton at the Toronto 53-yard line. Again, they throw the screen to Champion. And they are going to rule, I believe, that he was down at midfield. His knee touched down. Rocky Di Pietro was out there trying to throw the block, but he only got a piece of the tackler. Cliff Hewitt. And there you go. Good look at it. If he's down, all you got to do is touch that shoulder pad, which I believe he did, so that's an excellent call. The timing on those quick screens is so critical. You know, you've got so precise to get that blocker up, get that one little block. So the loss is actually about three yards, and the ball is just on the Hamilton side of midfield. This game is just roaring along. I mean, we've only got 10 minutes and 50 seconds left to play in this first half. Kerrigan just dumps it off to Jet Thomas. And that's obviously the game plan, because Kerrigan has looked to that back coming out of the backfield a number of times. Jet Tommy, whose roots go back to Ottawa, but who is from Guelph University, that's where he played his college ball, didn't play at all last year when he ripped up his knee, but he's a factor now as the fullback in that Hamilton scheme. It's third down and about a yard and change to go. And Ken Hobart comes in at quarterback. Now, for those of you who may not follow the CFL, Hobart is a great runner. Kerrigan is the pure passer. Hobart the runner, and they're gambling on third and a yard and a half to go. But they get to Dan Hucklock instead. Hucklock gets the first down as he gets to the Toronto 41 or 42 yard line. Well, that's a big first down to pick up. You want to keep this drive going. Toronto's come back with a field goal now. You want to answer it if you can. It's apparent what they're planning to do. As we see that short yardage play up over the top for Dan Hucklack. It's apparent with Toronto blitzes, they try. Kerrigan's going to go deeper downfield. When they drop off in the zone, he's just going to dump it to one of the backs. First down, Ticats. This one is picked up. David Marshall, the middle linebacker. And he's dragged down by Ken Zachary, but for the second time in this ball game, the Toronto Argonaut defense comes up big for them. First, Willie Pless. Now, David Marshall and the Ticats again are stalled. Well, this is simply a case of tunnel vision because he's looking dark. Di Pietro all the way. Does not see middle linebacker David Marshall. Had three interceptions on the year, and what a big one here. And what a good first half of play. It's 7-3. Hamilton leads Toronto with 9.21 left in the second quarter. We'll be back in a moment. There's a look at David Marshall, who was selected the Argos' top defensive player of 1986. And this is Cedric Mitter. Ooh, boy, was he sacked by Paul Bennett. 
as he got to about the Hamilton 42. He'll have a pickup of five yards. But it couldn't have helped his knees any. And I really think this is a smart idea by the Argonauts. And of course, they saw the Hamilton's last game of the season with Ottawa. Ottawa was able to run the football against this front four. And I think if Toronto's going to win, they have to do some of this as well. Four carries, 21 yards for Cedric Minter so far. But forget it this time. Boy, oh boy, when the Thai Cats start blowing in on you, like Rod Skillman did against J.C. Watts, it just turns a football game right around. And there's nothing more deflating than to have a little success on offense, and all of a sudden, a big sack like that takes you out of scoring range, and boy, the air comes out of the balloon in a hurry. Skillman just came in untouched. There you see two guys going after Mitchell Price. Skillman comes free, and the only guy to pick him up was J.C. Watts. <laughs> so Olesic is putting. And this rocket will be handled by Wayne Lee at his five. And he slips down as he gets over the 10 to about the 12. But again, the story of this football game has been the poor field position that Hamilton has been forced to endure most of this half. Well, it's coming up fast, isn't it? Two weekends from today. We'll all be in Vancouver. Leaf and I will show you the Great Cup game of 1985 on Saturday. And then live, the Great Cup Parade will come to you on CTV. On Sunday, the pregame show and the game itself. All the action, all the fun, and all the excitement here on CTV. Great Cup weekend, two weekends from today. Well, could be the Hamilton Tiger Cats. We'll show you them in the last year's replay on Saturday. This is Zachary. Zachary running hard is out over the 15 to about the 18. He'll have a pickup of about six yards. But you know, when you look at this Toronto Argonaut squad, this is really the best team they have put on the field in 1986. Their offensive line is by far the best that they've been able to field. And then with Willie Pless back and healthy, Cedric Mitter into the lineup offensively. I mean, they, they have not had personnel this good in all of this season. And there is Pless. Boy, he is a great-looking candidate for longevity in this league. Well, he didn't play for the Mississauga Juniors, I'll tell you that. He played at the University of Kansas and was one of the great linebackers in that school's history. That's Dwight Edwards, of course, who played for the Mississauga Juniors. Ken Zachary is the injured ball player on this play. And we can pick up exactly what happened to him. Uh, really tell you get those pileups well, big miles Gorel sitting on your head that might hurt a little bit I still think that it's not meant to be unkind but the best line that Leo Cahill ever had was what he said they should add an A to Miles's last name Miles didn't like it very much either. <laughs> Gorilla <laughs> because he is massive at 6 8 285 pounds well, let's hope there's nothing wrong with Ken Zachary. There's Big Miles. Well, he's up against Roger Aldag of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for the Offensive Lineman of the Year. And a great tribute to Miles and the entire offensive line. They've done a good job for Hamilton this year. I remember so many people saying, oh, if they could only get an offensive line, this could be a good football team. Well, now they have it. Well, they don't want to lose Ken Zachary, though. He's limping out the field. He looks like that angle's, ankle's pretty tender. He's the kind of guy you in a playoff series, you've got to have him in there. He's rushed the ball well, he catches the ball well, he averages almost 10 yards of reception. You know, he wasn't here very long, but he gained 275 yards rushing, almost five yards a carry, and a couple of touchdowns. He caught 12 passes. This is for a fellow who's only been in the lineup. This is his third game, I believe. And he's like all the new running backs. He's big, strong, and fast. 230 pounds, wow. It's second down, four yards to go, Hamilton. The pass is caught by B. Pietro out over the 30 to the 31-yard line. And it was a good thing that Kerrigan got rid of that ball because Marlon Jones was right in his face. Well, you're going to watch a veteran receiver read a zone coverage. There's the linebacker that goes out. Now he stops, works back to the inside, stays in the open area. And, you know, that's why you go to a Rocky B. Pietro who's been around for nine years in the crunch. You go to him because you know he'll be open. Biggest crowd of the season by far here in Iberwind Stadium this afternoon as the Cats start from their 32-yard line. First down. Kerrigan looked, 
And all oh, beautiful looking pattern again to Rocky Di Pietro up in midfield. Daryl Moyer is there to make the stop, but not before 23, gains 23, and Hamilton has moved the ball again. Well, the all time leading tie cat receiver in yardage receptions, he's 10th on the all time CFL list. Makes the catch, but Kerrigan stands in, takes the big hit. You know, he threw that before Rocky even made his last break. That's great timing. Rocky has caught three for 43 yards this afternoon. Hamilton with a first down at midfield. And the give is to the fullback, Jed Tommy, but there's nothing there. Tommy will get maybe a yard as he ran right into the heart of that defensive alignment of the Argos. They play a 4-3. With Marlon Jones, Gerald Bayless, Mark Seal, and Rodney Harding in front, across the front. Seven to three is our score. A touchdown by Tony Champion, a field goal by Lance Chomick. That's the scoring to this point, with five minutes and 40 seconds left to play in this first half. It's been a good one. Kerrigan fires. The catch is made by Di Pietro for the first down inside the 40 to the 38-yard line. Willie Press finally brings him down. 15 yards, the pickup by the fellow that Leaf told you is considered a physical receiver. Well, they go to the right guy. You know, Toronto only rushed three people. They drop nine off. You go to the right guy because Rocky can find those open spots in the zone coverage. Watch Carl Brasley bounce off him. It's like a little mosquito just hitting him. First down, Ticats. Ooh! Boy, was Kerrigan fortunate that Parker didn't steal that one and go the distance. Steve Stapler was the intended receiver. Kerry Parker been victimized a couple of times by Tony Champion. This time, Steve Stapler working on him. And if you're going to throw the wide side out, you better have a gun for an arm. That time, Kerrigan was very fortunate. He hung the ball up and... Harry Parker couldn't make the catch, but that could have been deadly. So it's second and ten tie catch. The ball is at the Argo 38. Well, Di Pietro tried to make a one-handed catch. There was no way the ball was high and behind him. He took the hit from Willie Pless, nevertheless. Well, the key thing, though, they, they weren't able to pick up the first down, but they drove it deep out of their own territory once again, and they're going to end up with a field goal opportunity by Paul Osbaldiston, and that really has been the key in the first half, Hamilton's ability to get themselves out of trouble. I saw Kerrigan walk over to Wayne Lee and have a word with him. It tells me that Lee must have run the wrong pattern. <laughs> As Osbaldiston will try this one from 45, his longest this year was 51 yards, so this is within his range. It is good. Well, what a job that young man has done since coming out and replaced the injured Bernie Rua. Paul Osbaldiston has given the Hamilton Ticats a 10-3 lead, and we'll be back in just a moment. Ken Zachary is a Tiger Cats major running threat. There is a chance he will not be back in this ballgame. Sprained left ankle. He will not play this quarter. They'll try to get him back in shape at halftime. Well, that would be a real bad blow. You know, I saw him down on the field before the game, and when I first saw him, I thought it was a defensive lineman. I couldn't believe the size of him. The ball blows off the kicking tee, so Osbaldiston has to put it back up there. Ticats have 15 first downs, Toronto only four. Ticats have 219 offensive yards to Toronto's 53. And yet it's only a 10-3 ball game in favor of the Ticats. Well, they've been playing on a long football yeah. field today. No, that's right. This is Dwight Edwards from his 16. And Edwards gets out to the 35, 36 yard line, which is where the Argos are going to put it into play. Ed Gatavakis did a great job down there just to slow up Dwight Edwards just when it looked as though he had a steep bit of room to move through. But they spot the ball right at the 35 as J.C. Watts comes out to continue as the Argonaut quarterback. You know, you made a point earlier. You thought maybe they might make a switch. And I think if things continue this way and they give good protection to the quarterback, then you might see Conrad Holloway come in because it's a safer bet with him in there. He doesn't have to move around as much.
This is the dimension, however, that J.C. adds to this game plan. He gets the first down out over the 45 to about the 48-yard line and chased out by Grover Covington. There's a penalty marker down on the field. And it's in the Hamilton secondary. Well, you know, when you look at these two quarterbacks, Holloway and J.C. Watts, Watts averages 6.5 yards when he runs with the football. Holloway, 2.3. A prime example why JC is starting this holding game to get away from Hamilton. that rush. First down. There was a holding penalty against somebody in that tie cat secondary. And consequently, because he made the first down, Toronto declines the penalty. As you take a look at Al Bruno, he feels very good about his club. He is concerned at their lack of consistency on offense. But today they've certainly come through, although they only do have the 10 points. Cedric Benner, boy, there appeared to be movement along the line of scrimmage or the ball came out late or something. Nevertheless, no penalty marker down as Benner gets to about the 51 where Grover Covington makes the tackle. A little trouble with the exchange from center Mark Napolitan and J.C. Watts. You know, Al Bruno, I think the most significant thing he said at our press conference with him yesterday was, you have to treat this game like you can't protect the lead. If you get a lead, you've got to keep trying to pour it on. You can't sit back on it. Pick up was three yards at second and seven. And this is Keith Baker. Well, he has the option to throw. And he does to Warren Hudson. Well, a little razzle-dazzle in the Toronto offense, which is not known for it. It was the actually a lateral pass to Keith Baker. He throws the forward pass off of it. And though it wasn't designed to go to Warren Hudson, I'm sure they do pick up the first down. Well, he was a quarterback at Texas Southern and they have this in their scheme for him to throw it. And let me tell you, if he throws it deep, he can throw it a long way. So two minutes and 40 seconds left to play in the first half. The Hamilton Ticats out in front of the Toronto Argonauts 10 to 3. And the Argos hoping that they can put a little bit of a march together there and maybe tie up this ball game. We'll see if they do when we come back in a moment. Seconds left to play in the half. Toronto with a first down at the Hamilton 48-yard line. Watts is going deep looking for Smith. He's got it at the five and in for the touchdown. In speaking with Bob Obilovich yesterday, he told me he thought they could get the Paul Bennett. Well, I haven't seen the films. I suspect they got the Paul Bennett on that one because Daryl Smith was in behind them and scored an easy touchdown. Well, they got the matchup they wanted. Three receivers to one side, and that means Paul Bennett's locked up man-to-man -man with the third guy inside. That was Daryl Smith. He just simply took it straight up field, a good throw, and 48 yards later, he's got his team in a position to tie it up. Exactly the kind of game that many of us felt it would be, tight, because the clubs have played so tightly against each other. Toronto won two games by a total of three points. Hamilton won the other game by ten. Well, you know, sometimes you put offensive schemes in just to go against certain guys, and you make a good point about Paul Bennett. That's the guy in the secondary you want to attack, and well, I remember as a receiver, when they call a certain play, and you know that maybe you're going to be the one that gets to work against Bennett, he got a great chance to score, and Daryl Smith took advantage. And Lance Chomick's point after has tied the ball game and tied the series at 10 points apiece. This is the first game of a two-game total point series. There would not be overtime at the end of this ball game if the clubs are tied. The Carling O'Keefe Game Stars of today's game will receive a Royal Canadian Mint one ounce gold coin. Presented by Remington Products, makers of the 3M Surgical Clippers for Hospitals, and the Microscreen Rechargeable for you at home. Advanced shaving technology only from Remington. Jamek is ready for the kickoff. So is Tony Champion and Howard Fields. They are back to return it. And this will be Fields from his 24-yard line. And he's...
dropped as he crosses the 45 to about the 47. He was able to get by Dan Rasovich and it looked for a moment as though Fields was going to take that one a long way. But then hopping on his back was Gerald Bayless. And so the Ticats still, nevertheless, do start in good field position. Well, there's Gerald Bayless, and that's not a great deal of punt playing on the kickoff team, but he makes the best of it. Kerrigan has been effective throwing the football, but he has had two interceptions, and both snuffed out what looked like very promising Hamilton drives. And this time he is snowed under back at the 40-yard line by Mark Seal, the former Ottawa Rough Rider who has really played well in the last half of this season, comes on to make the sack for the Argos, who are not known for their sacking ability. Well, I think he's finally found a home in Toronto. You know, he was originally the 12th round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 1982, protected by Ottawa, bumped around to Saskatchewan a few teams, but has really played well for the Argonauts this year. And big sack right there. Argos ranked last in the league in quarterback sacks. They only had 43. The pass for Stickler is picked out by Daryl Moyer. Moyer is down to the 32-yard line of the Ticats. The third interception of this half. Mike Kerrigan throws the ball well, but obviously he throws it into coverage too often. And on that occasion, Moyer just sat back there, and that was like picking cherries. Well, Mike Kerrigan has to understand that sometimes the defense wins some battles, and you've got to throw the football away or eat it. Every time he's thrown into coverage today and taken a chance, they've picked it off. That's the third one, and sooner or later, all these things catch up with you. 33 yards, the return by Moyer. First down, Toronto at the Hamilton 32. The pass is caught by Keith Baker. And Baker is inside the 25-yard line for a pickup of about eight yards before Frank Robinson slid across to make the stop along with Terry Lane, number 37. Well, once again, the key, though, is they're getting great yardage on their first down plays. And it's simply that quick screen to the wide receivers. I think that's about the fifth time now they've run that. I don't think they've got less than eight yards every time they tried it. There's Daryl Boyer, eight years. Originally from the University of Calgary, played with Montreal. Calgary Stampeders and the big play he made right there only had one interception in 1986 but that was a good one he had just then. You notice that Howard Fields is out of the lineup and Terry Lane number 37 is in to replace him. I'm wondering if Fields was shaken up when he returned that kickoff just moments ago. Well I can see him standing over in the sidelines there and there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with him. It's second down two yards to go. Hard goes the ball inside the Hamilton 25. Little play action fake, and then J.C. takes off himself. Touchdown! Julius Caesar Watts has put the Toronto Argonauts out in front, 16 to 10, with a 25-yard scamper. Well, when things are going your way, it's funny how it works, you know. The element of surprise, he wanted to hit the home run ball to Chris Woods, but great coverage dictates that he has to now run with it. Nobody there to stop him. 25 yards, a touchdown. The interceptions finally caught up with the Ticats. Well, it's been an outstanding effort by that defensive squad of the Toronto Argonauts, and it goes to show you what a difference that kid Willie Pless does make. Plus the fact that the Argo quarterback is now getting some time and because it is J.C. Watts, when the people are covered, he can take off. He hasn't thrown the ball particularly well today, but he has done it effectively enough to keep the yardsticks moving on occasion. And right now, the Argos, with a minute and 20 seconds left to play in the first half, have gone in front for the first time in this ball game, 17 to 10. Well, I, I sure like the style of the Argonaut offense on that play. You know, second and short. Why not take a shot at going for the home run? Of course, he couldn't get the pass into Chris Woods, but he ran for the touchdown. I like that kind of offense. It excites everybody on the team. It excites the guys on defense, offense, everything. And boy, when you do that, you've got a lot of success. Well, 
Well, that touchdown really set up by the interception by Daryl Moyer, who tells me that there's been no change in their defensive scheme. He said he got lucky with the overthrow by Kerrigan, but he says the key in the last uh, quarter has been the pressure by the front four. He says that's where the Argonauts are really starting to turn it on defensively. The kickoff will be handled by Fields at his 22. There's that scene we talked about on the last kickoff. Fields is all the way down to the 10 yard line. That's exactly that scene that Dan Rasevich missed the last time. And the same seam opened up, and this time he goes 77 yards. I'll tell you what, this is entertainment at its best. Look at the blocking here. They set it up. What a great sh shot to run through. Howard Field, 77 yards. Well, they, they could answer that touchdown by J.C. Watts right away. That's what you want to do. You've got to try and reestablish yourself. And what a great opportunity for Mike Kerrigan now. They're at the 11-yard line. They've got to punch it in. A saving tackle by Lance Chomick as the Ticats have the ball just outside the Toronto 10. And around to Tony Champion. Read well by Carl Brasley. And then Wilson comes in to help out. There will be a loss of a couple. Well, I think they're going to call Champion for objectionable conduct, too. As he got up off the ground, he took a shot at somebody. Well, Brasley just played it perfectly. Here's the call. Objectionable conduct, penalty number one. Well, that's why we call Lee Pedersen the spy. <laughs> he can detect these things. No, this is an area where you really have to keep your composure. You know, Tony Champion's thinking, gosh, on the reverse, I've got a chance to score here. All of a sudden... Carl Brasley makes a great defensive play. Tony Champion's frustrated. He thought maybe he should get that one in the end zone on that kind of a trick play. And he gets up off the ground. Somebody probably said, no way you're going to get by me. And he took exception to that. Cost him 15 big yards. Yeah, and Al Bruno's not going to be happy at that. I mean, it's bad enough losing a couple of yards. But then when you get the objectionable conduct tacked on, the ball is back to the 22-yard line. First down, Hamilton. Excuse me, second down. Now, again, the receiver did not look. Wayne Lee got down to the secondary of the Argo defense, and instead of looking for the football, he was trying to deep the defensive back. Kerrigan, who doesn't have all day to throw the football, threw it, and Lee wasn't looking. So instead of a shot at a game-tying touchdown, a couple of real miscues by the Ticats have forced them into a Paul Osbaldiston field goal attempt. It'll come from the 29-yard line. And it's wide. Well, this was a nightmare for the Ticats. With 52 seconds left to play in this first half, the Argos lead it by 6, 17 to 11. Boy, can you feel a momentum shift? You know, sometimes we kind of over overplay momentum, but, boy, oh, boy, it really has changed around here in the second quarter. Things were really going well for the Tiger Cats. They, they moved the ball well. Now, all of a sudden, Big run by J.C. Watts, a couple of interceptions, and now a missed field goal. You really feel it shifting. Ticats are fortunate, Leaf, apropos to your comment, that the half is coming to an end. They'll get a chance to go in there and regroup because if there was about 10 minutes to go in this half, you're liable to see Argos, you know, score a couple of fast touchdowns. Pass goes to Cedric Bitter. And Cedric is out over the 45 to the 46 with Jim Rockford, 26, and Frank Robinson, 43, are there to bring him down. Well, we're just 46 minutes away from halftime, and here's what will happen. The Pacific Western Stars of the Week, the Eastern CFL Awards. We'll preview all of those things for you, and of course, Leaf will have a highlight or two if we have time at halftime. Watts threw the ball right into Skillman's hands. Oh, what a break. Rod Skillman was standing there. J.C. Watts could have eaten the ball. Instead, he tried to get it upfield. Covington had him wrapped up, and he just drilled the ball into Skillman. This comes with 28 seconds left to play in the half. Well, it sure makes it exciting, but I know both coaches would be really upset at their quarterbacks. 
This is a ball you shouldn't throw. You got the lead at halftime. Just take the sack. You got the best kicker in the league with 28 seconds left. Kick it out of trouble. Boy, oh boy, JC, you don't throw those balls, but nice play by Rod Skillman. The ball is at the Toronto 31 yard line. The flag comes down as Kerrigan had his arm hit just as he was prepared to throw it. And holding will be the call against the Ticats. Well, what had been a very, very well played first half is deteriorating a little here. The final holding, minutes. Hamilton number 66. First down repeated. Miles Gorell is called for holding. Well, that's why they let him go in Montreal a few years ago. Joe Gallat simply said, this guy takes too many holding penalties. He kills us out there. But. He told us that in an airport one day. Yeah. I remember he said, the guy is killing us. So the ball is now back outside the 41-yard line. 23 seconds left, as you see. Clock starts on the snap of the ball. The pass is caught by Stapler. Boy, that is a real timing pattern because the moment he turned around, the ball was there. Couldn't have had better coverage by Kerry Parker, but that's a big play now. They've, they've at least got it back into field goal range for Paul Osbaldison. They're going to go to the hurry-up offense. Take a shot now at the end zone. You've got 18 seconds left. 11 seconds left, please. Excuse me. 18 seconds. You were right. I was looking at the score. <laughs> Rocky DiPietro down to the 15-yard line. David Marshall was there to make the stop. All right, take your timeout now. I think 10 seconds left. Take the timeout. They're going to do that. Now you've got one shot into the end zone from the 15-yard line. If you catch it, of course, you score. If it goes incomplete, the clock stops and you get to kick the field goal. So Kerrigan goes over to have a chat with Al Bruno. There's Tom Porras, the backup quarterback, number eight. As Toronto hangs on to a six-point lead, they obviously figured they were going to the dressing room with that lead, but it, chances are this score is going to change here in the final ten seconds. It's really been funny, I think, the play of Mike Kerrigan here in the first half. He's really been hot and cold. He's had some super drives, and then he's thrown some horrible balls that's been, that have been intercepted. He's thrown three of them. But then these last two, that pass to Stapler, the pass to DiPietro, were just super throws. Well, Tony Champion's been the big play man in most of the games against Toronto this year. Maybe he's the guy they'll go to. You don't think they'd look for Rocky, eh? Well, that's, that's as good a choice as you could make. I agree. Well, there's the old spy calling Tony Champion, and of course it did go to Champion. There was contact in the end zone. No penalty marker comes down on Daryl Wilson. And so with five seconds left, it's second down. Now, now Porras and Osbaldiston are both coming out onto the field, so we'll have the field goal attempt. Well, the Ticats did the smart thing. They, Al Bruno, you credit him with all that because he had the presence to call the timeout. to get a shot in the end zone, but now at least Paul Osbaldiston will have a chance to add three. And when you're in a total point series, every point counts. Mm -hmm. This time it is good. So with two seconds left on the clock, the Toronto lead is now just three points. Toronto 17, Hamilton 14. It was 7 nothing at the end of the first quarter for the Ticats. And it has been a very entertaining first half up until the final couple of minutes of it. And then they kind of got sloppy and took ridiculous penalties and threw passes that shouldn't have been thrown. Well, it still makes for excitement, though. Sure does. <laughs> Even if you're throwing those interceptions. It's funny how you approach a game like this. Two-game total point. Well, you know, this is halftime of the first game, but really the whole first game is just the half. It's, it's, mentally, it's got to be kind of tough for the players at times. Argos are just going to ground the ball. JC does that. And so the Argos go to the locker room with a three-point advantage after the first half 
of this, the first game of the two-game total point series. Argos have to be very pleased with themselves. They played well on both sides of the ball, capitalized on their opportunities. The Hamilton Ticats moved the ball up and down the field, but had three big interceptions, and not a whole lot of people on their side of the ledger are going to be pleased about that. But Upcoming in our halftime show, the Pacific Western Airlines Stars of the Week, including a review of the big winners in the second half of the regular season. We'll also run down the Eastern Award winners, the Eastern Shenley nominees. This is Game 1 of the Eastern Championship on CTV. Most outstanding players in the offensive, defensive, and lineman categories are recognized as Pacific Western Airlines Stars of the Week. Winners from the last week of the regular season schedule included defensive back Keith Gooch, number 18, for the BC Lions. His theft of the ball from Winnipeg's Jeff Boyd and blocked punt led to 10 BC points as the Lions won home field advantage for their Western semifinal rematch. Lineman Star of the Week was awarded to Edmonton's number 36, Stuart Hill, winning his third star of 86. Hill highlighted an outstanding performance with a fumble recovery as the Eskimos froze Saskatchewan 42-14. And Edmonton's number 25, Tom Richards, caught the offensive star along with seven passes for 188 yards and a touchdown. The Brantford, Ontario native added a 45-yard punt return for the Western Division leading Eskimos. Today, CTV Profile highlights the Stars of the Year candidates emerging from the second half of the CFL's regular season. Stars of the Year winners are decided on the basis of points accumulated over the course of the regular season. Points are also awarded for second and third place. So consistency of performance obviously is a very important factor. The defensive category this year featured 10 different winners in the second half. Argonaut linebacker Willie Pless took a star in week 11, while defensive backs Richie Hall in week 12 and Alvis Satelli from week 16 carried the Calgary colors. The Montreal Alouettes were represented by defensive backs Steve Benjamin and the CFL's interception leader, Terry Irvin. Danny Bass of the Western Division leading Edmonton Eskimos and teammate Craig Schaefer, along with Hamilton's Frank Robinson and nine-year CFL veteran Ben Zambiazzi earned stars from their linebacker positions. The Battle of the Trenches was won by defensive linemen in the second half of 1986, but that old adage that offensive linemen are only noticed when they miss an assignment was negated by three very worthy winners. Winnipeg six foot seven tackle Chris Walby shares this distinction with 11 year veteran Roger Aldag of the Western Riders and nine year CFLer Bob Poley, center for the Calgary Stampeders. Defensive linemen earning stars match the list of who's who in the sack department. There's CFL leader James Crick Parker with 22. Montreal's Brett Williams finished tied for second at 21, while Calgary's Harold Hallman had 19 to his credit. Mike Gray of the BC Lions starred in week 19, but it was Edmonton's number 36, Stuart Hill, who dominated the second half with three first place selections. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers clearly dominated the offensive category. They had five firsts out of a possible 10. And the depth of their offensive arsenal was certainly illustrated by who won the awards. Their quarterback, a receiver, a running back, even their place kicker earned first place stars in the second half of the 86 regular season. John Huffnagel earned two first place selections with Joe Poplowski on the receiving end of a star in week 12. Running back James Sykes was honored in week 11 and Trevor Kennard returned from an injury to kick his way to stardom in week 15. The balance in Calgary's attack is shown by running back Gary Allen and wide receiver Ray Alexander being honored, while Alouette wide receiver James Hood and BC quarterback Roy DeWalt round out the offensive category. The second half review of Stars of the Week winners and challengers for Stars of the Year honors has been brought to you by Pacific Western Airlines, serving over 40 Canadian destinations. This is the Eastern Championship Game 1 on CTV. Halftime continues in a moment. And CTV has exclusive coverage of the Vanier Cup. Tomorrow, CFL stars will be there. The Vanier Cup, November 22nd here on CTV. This is the CTV Television Network.
This is CFCN in Calgary, Lethbridge, and Medicine Hat. The Argonauts and the Tiger Cats, game one of their two-game series, and we are at halftime at Ivor Wynn. And since we are trying to decide who has the best team in the CFL East, it is only appropriate that we take a moment now to honor the best players in the CFL East. All those Shenley Award nominees from all four teams have now been whittled down to just one. This is the Leo Dandoran Trophy, awarded annually to the player judged to be the most outstanding offensive lineman in the East. And in 1986, that is tackle Miles Gorell of the Hamilton Tiger Cats, a nine-year veteran of CFL trench warfare. Miles is a product of the University of Ottawa, and he has the size for a tackle at 6'7", 280, and has had an outstanding season protecting his quarterbacks and blowing gaping holes for Tiger Cat running backs. The James P. McCaffrey Trophy, awarded annually to the Eastern Division's best defensive player. And this year, that's the toaster. Montreal Alouette defensive tackle Brett Williams in only his second season in the CFL, though he honed his skills with several teams in the NFL and USFL. Good size, 6'3", 260, but it is Brett's outstanding quickness and agility that make him so well-suited to the Canadian game. He finished the year with 21 sacks. Awarded each year to the most outstanding Canadian player in the Eastern Division, the Lou Heyman Trophy. And a two-time winner is Hamilton slotback Rocky DiPietro. Born in Sault Ste. Marie, he's another U of Ottawa product who's played his entire pro career with the Tiger Cats. He has impressive statistics despite missing several games due to injury and playing for an offense that does not roll up a lot of yardage. 86 receptions and over 1,000 total yards. The Frank M. Gibson Trophy is awarded every year to the best rookie in the East. And despite missing a third of the season due to injury, Argonaut linebacker Willie Pless impressed the judges. As much with his infectious enthusiasm and constant aggressive play as with his three interceptions and three fumble recoveries. Willie is the first Toronto rookie winner since Cedric Minter in 1981. And now the big one, the Jeff Russell Memorial Trophy, originally donated in 1928. It goes to the most outstanding player in the East. And over the course of the 86 regular season, that was James Hood, record-setting wide receiver of the Montreal Alouettes. Although the Owls offense struggled much of the year, James was simply electrifying, hauling in 95 passes for 1,411 yards. He inspires his teammates and excites the fans, a very worthy winner. And next week, all the winners will be presented with their trophies at the awards dinner just before the second game of the Eastern Final. That dinner takes place in Toronto. There is, of course, a corresponding process underway in the West. We will announce all the Western winners next week when CTV televises the Western Final. That's Sunday, November the 23rd, 4.30 Eastern start. This is Game 1 of the Eastern Championship on CTV. Statistics, the bottom line is the important one. Toronto 17, Hamilton 14, and then just move above that to the turnovers. That's the big reason. Three turnovers to one. Pat, I thought the biggest play in the first half had to be the J.C. Watts 25-yard run for the touchdown. Daryl Moyer had just made their third interception of the first half, and the Argonaut offense took advantage. J.C. Watts scored the touchdown. At that point, they put them ahead 17-10. to 10. The big play of the first half. All right, we're ready for quarter number three as Lance Chomick kicks it low to Wayne Lee at the 34-yard line. That's a great return by Lee because, I mean, he reversed his field, zipped and zagged, and got across midfield to about the 53. Now he made a heck of a catch on that kick. You know, that thing was coming like a rocket. Tough ball to handle, and you hear the crowd reaction as Kenny Hobart comes in to start the second half. I think that's a pretty good move on Al Bruno's part. Mike Kerrigan looked good at times, but at other times he threw that ball up for grabs. Well, he completed 17 of 25 for 223, which is, you know, 68%, but he threw those three interceptions. Hobart's first pass is dropped by Rocky DiPietro. Uh, that's not the way you want to start, too, especially when you've got a new quarterback coming in the game. You want to help him get his confidence as quickly as you can. And, Rocky should have had that ball. Maybe you can see that shamrock on the back of Rocky's helmet. And of course, rather than the black armband, that's 
They got the shamrock up there in honor of Frank King Clancy. So Hobart, who didn't complete 50% of his passes this season, is in at quarterback for Hamilton on second and 10. This time he drills at the stapler, and again the pass is dropped. Well, he should be two for two. Instead, he's 0 for two. There is a penalty marker down on the field, however. Procedure, Hamilton number 23. Well, it wouldn't have mattered whether Stapler got the pass or not, except they still have a shot at second down. Boy, how frustrating that must be for Kenny Hobart. I mean, you cannot throw the ball any better than that. Rocky drops one, who's usually so reliable, and Steve Stapler drops another one. Well, there's the illegal procedure trying to get a running head start. Carl Brazley and Chris Woods drop back to return this punt from Steve Stapler, only his second of the ball game. Strange looking ball. He gets it high. A flag comes down as Brazley made the catch at the 22. No yards will be the penalty. Leo Ezrin was there to make the stop. It was only a 33 yard punt. But the 15 yard penalty is going to negate that. No yards. Hamilton number 72. First down. So Ezrin's has called for no yards. He was the man who made the tackle. But Toronto is going to take over outside their 35 at about the 37 yard line as you take a look at J.C. Watts wasn't wildly impressive throwing the football six for 13 99 yards but he did have a touchdown pass and he ran for another himself as the Argos lead it by three 17 to 14 as they take possession for the first time in this third quarter pass goes to Cedric Minter and Minter is wrapped up by Leo Esrins back of the line of scrimmage it'll be a loss of a couple well it was really number 77 Grover Covington the defensive end that did the job on that he kept stringing the play out wider and wider and wider finally Esmond's able to make the tackle but that's what you have to do force that back back into the inside where you're going to get some help Lee, if we haven't had an opportunity of seeing Cedric Minner until today he looks to me like he's lost a half a step well, he might have Watch past there is boy lousy communication between he and Keith Baker because the ball sailed over his head by about 15 yards. That's the second time that's happened today and and both times J.C. Watts thought Baker was going deep. Now I played with Keith Baker. I know he's a very smart receiver. He reads coverages exceptionally well and makes the good adjustments and maybe he's reading something that J.C.'s not seeing. So Paul Bennett and Wayne Lee drop back to return this Hank Elissick punt. It's a beauty. Lee fumbles the ball inside his 15. Then the ball comes loose, but the Thai Cats are fortunate. They get it back at the 25 yard line. It was the newcomer, Jim Rockford, I believe, number 26, who made the recovery. On well, the one chance today that Hank elissick has been able to let out some shaft, he really does so with a huge kick. And the Tie Cats are very fortunate. Wayne Lee coughs it up, but there's 26 Jim Rockford. So it's a 17-14 ball game in favor of the Argos. We'll be back in a moment. 64-yard punt by Hank Elissick, a 13-yard return as it turns out by the Tie Cats. Wayne Lee fumbled it forward. And Jim Rockford fell on it at the 25 yard line. Coming into this ball game, Kenny Hobart had been good on 48% of his passes. He had thrown only two touchdown passes this season. He had six intercepted. And he's the man at the controls, number four for the Tie Cats right now, Ken Hobart. Fires to Tony Champion. Champion ducks one tackle. And then is forced out of bounds, but he has the first down up at the 44-yard line. He was able to get by Cliff Hewitt and pick up 19 yards. Well, that's the one dimension all these speedsters have. If they miss the first tackle on a guy like Tony Champion, he can go the distance in a hurry. Cliff Hewitt had a good chance to take him down. Couldn't do so. Tony Champion picks up about another 10 yards.
Hobart looking, there was nobody there. I really believe that he thought that number 67, Ralph Schultz, was a receiver because when he looked up, he had so much pressure on him that he just, you know, unloaded it to somebody wearing a Hamilton jersey. Well, he'd be the biggest receiver he could throw to. <laughs> But you know, Cobart ran a bootleg to the short side of the field, and that's a tough play to run because there's not much area to work with with three receivers out there, and Toronto covered it easily. There are penalty markers down, and so is Hobart. The ball comes loose. It was a good hit by Cliff Hewitt. Argos think they have the ball, but the officials ruled that Hobart's knee had touched the ground. Boy, he took a good shot by Cliff Hewitt there. Legal, Legal procedure, Hamilton, number 17. Wayne Lee, illegal procedure. And as Leaf pointed out, they are ruling that Hobart was down when the ball came free. As you've heard many, many times before, the ground cannot cause a fumble. If you've been hit and you go down and the, the force of the ground meeting your body cannot force a fumble. So it brings up a third down and nine yards to go. Stapler, this punt will be handled by Brazley at the 32. And he gets it over the 35 to about the 38-yard line. So the Argos will start there as the Hamilton defense now comes out onto the field. They gave up only 30 touchdowns in 1986 as you take a look at that hit by Cliff Hewitt. Yeah, he really took a, got a good hit on Kenny Hobart's knee and Hobart limped off to the sidelines and trying to see if they're working on him over there. But And there's no question that it was the ground that forced the fumble because when his hand hit the ground, that's when the ball came out. J.C. Watts to Chris Woods, and it's neatly broken up by Lance Shields, number 28. Well, Lance Shields originally played in the United States Football League, and he came to Hamilton last September on a 21-day trial. They liked what they saw. They brought him back this year to training camp, and he had eight interceptions on the year in his first year with Hamilton, and he makes just a superb play right here. Broke on the football, timed it perfectly, no interference, got the hand around and knocked it down. That's tremendous defense. Ticats had 43 interceptions this year. That's second in the CFL. Well, J.C. Watts did just a terrific job but you know who's got unbelievable speed is that Rod Skillman. Zambiazzi and Ezrin's finally chased him down, but Skillman came from the backside, and I mean, he was within a whisper of just getting to it. Well, I know J.C. could feel that oh. hot breath on the back of his neck. Watch this now. He bails out of the pocket. He has to. He's forced out of there. Watch Skillman 59, though. He does have tremendous speed, but J.C. Watts, you know, he could have just taken it out of bounds. Watch him cut back here. That's what you like to see, a guy that he really wants to win this game. Look at that. Cuts inside of Mark Streeter. Has the first down at the Toronto 54-yard line. Boy, the screen to the running back, Cedric Benner, has dropped. A matter there of wanting to run before he had the ball. Penalty markers come down. We've got a little bit of a scuffle going on. It's good play to run against Hamilton, too. They get such good penetration from that front four. Screening often works well against them. Dave Kersinger was Objection mixing it up. Objection to conduct. Hamilton, number 72. First down. But the penalty goes against Leo Ezrins. It was Kersinger, number 68, of Toronto against Leo Ezrin, 72, of Hamilton. They've had a couple of penalties that have really hurt them. Remains to be seen whether this one does, but that penalty to Tony Champion for objectionable conduct late in the second quarter really took them out of good scoring position. And in this situation, it gives Toronto a first down at the Hamilton 46-yard line. Nine and a half minutes left to play in the third quarter. Toronto ahead by three points. The ball is loose. 
Now I believe it was Kersinger who fell on the football. No, it's Dan Ferroni. Excuse me, Calvin Prunster. Well, we've named them all. It had to be one of them. <laughs> What's behind door number three? <laughs> the Argonauts are very fortunate here. You know, JC tries to get up after he slips down. He's going to be hit by Mike Walker, Ben Zambiazzi. The ball comes loose, and I'll tell you, Kelvin Prunster makes just a super play here. He's a lineman. He doesn't handle a football, but he cradles it and grabs it. Boy, they're fortunate. Ball is back to the Toronto 43-yard line. Just that little screen to Keith Baker, and Baker gets over the 50 to about the 51, which will leave the Argos about 20 yards short of the first down. Mitchell Price 65, Frank Robinson 43, there to make the stop. Well, J.C. Watts did the smart thing, and I think Artis Celta, he calls all the plays from up here in the press box. They said, look, it's second in a in a 50 yards to go for a first down. Don't do anything stupid. We're going to have to give it up. Let Hank kick us out of trouble, and they did the smart thing. Paul Bennett allows the ball to bounce, and it bounces out of bounds at about the 23-yard line. So the Argos hang on to that three-point lead. Toronto 17, Hamilton 14. We'll be back with the Hamilton Tigers. Tiger defense is really fired up right now. Rod Skillman telling us that at halftime in the dressing room, there's no fancy X's and O's. They just sat and stewed. He says they are very angry. They feel they've played well enough to be well ahead. If yardage means anything, Dan, they, they've had enough yardage to be ahead in this game, but costly turnovers have been the story. He also says the Argonauts won't score another point this half. <laughs> that may be true. <laughs> Ticat start from the 23. Zachary is back in the ball game. And probably wishes that he isn't because he only gets to the 25. Gerald Bayless had the initial penetration that just messed the entire play up. You know, you're a defensive lineman and they run the football. If you get that penetration, so many good things then happen. The rest of the defense made the play for him, but 99 was the guy who originally got in there and slowed him down. So the pickup was about a yard and a half. It's second down Hamilton. Well, that's what Hobart can do that Kerrigan can't, but that's also what Don Moan can do, is hit you and hit you a good lick, too, and make you feel it. Of course, whenever we talk about Don Moan, I always think of the University of British Columbia Thunderbirds, and Don's a graduate of that university. You're going to see them next Saturday in the Vanier Cup, and of course, they'll take on the University of Western Ontario Mustangs, number one and two ranked teams in the country. We'll have it for you next Saturday afternoon. Steve Stapler back into putt. It's third in the yard to go, and the Ticats are not going to gamble at their own 32-yard line. And that one bounces out of bounds at the Argo 49-yard line. Well, next Saturday on Wide World of Sports, we'll have the Rothman's Poor Sports Car Race for you. Along with the Dracar Noir Squash Championship. I know that Leaf will be watching that one with interest. The Junior Synchronized Swimming, the Duets, and the America's Cup Report all come to you next Saturday on CTV's Wide World of Sports. <laughs> so the Argos, who have not moved the ball well here in the third quarter, start again from the shotgun. JC on a quarterback draw. And he gets about four yards. Rod Skillman and Paul Bennett combine on the tackle, 59 and 27. Well, you know, I think J.C.'s convinced that if they're to win this game this afternoon, of course, they lead 17-14. He's the guy that's going to have to do it for them. They haven't had a great deal of success passing. The one long one to Daryl Smith for a touchdown, but the success they've had has been J.C. Watts running the football. He scored the last time these two teams met here on the quarterback draw, just like that one. Second down, about six yards to go. Watts pass, no good. He was looking for Paul Pearson. Howard Fields on the coverage. It's a 
tough pass to catch. The angle's always tough looking back over your shoulder like that. You know, you say, well, heck, it's only an eight-yard pass downfield. It should be easy. That's a tough angle for a receiver. So, again, Hank Alyssa comes in. The defenses now are starting to take over this ball game. It's a nice spot for Hank. He's about 58 yards away from the goal line, so he can kind of air this one out and still try and pin them deep. Low pass from center, but he gets it away, and it's a good one. Lee is back inside his 10. And gets up to about the 16-yard line, which is where the Ticats are going to put it into play. And as Leaf mentioned just a couple of seconds ago, it's the UBC Thunderbirds and the University of Western Ontario Mustangs in the 1986 Vanier Cup next Saturday. And note the start time. It's 12.30 Eastern Standard Time. And we go to Varsity Stadium for that one. As nice a football stadium as any you'll ever see. Yeah, it's got a lot of character down there. The kids have a great time. We always have a great time doing that game. And of course, every year I'm not disappointed. The university players are bigger, better, faster. This year will be no exception. Hobart looking for champion. It's picked off by Daryl Moyer. Boy, give that Toronto Argonaut secondary all kinds of credit. They are real ball hawks here today. Well, they're a team that really only had 29 interceptions on the year. That ranked them fifth. And today they have their fourth, Daryl Moyer's second. And it seems like Hamilton does not have any kind of game plan when they're throwing deep downfield. So the score remains. Toronto 17, Hamilton 14. Argos have the ball when we come back. Oh, Moyer, the eight-year veteran from the University of Calgary Dinosaurs, only had one interception all season, has two today. You know, I remember Daryl Moyer a few years ago. He, he likes playing against Hamilton. When he played for Calgary in one of the highest-scoring games in CFL history, it was his interception for a touchdown that won that game for the Stampeders, so he likes playing against the Ticats. He's given the Argos possession at their 49-yard line. Cedric Mitter dances his way beyond the line of scrimmage and picks up about eight yards. Frank Robinson, 43, was there to make the stop, along with Leo Ezrin, 72. Well, you know the story about Cedric Minner. He was involved in a 1983 great cup for the Argonauts, played out his option, went to the Jets, hung around for a couple of years. Now he's back. Bob Obilovich likes him for his pass-catching abilities more than his running. Picked up about eight yards, so it's second and two. And I give the again to Minter and this time he has the first down in Hamilton territory at about the 48 yard line before Ben Zambiazzi and Leo Ezrin's combine on the stop. I mean Zambiazzi has not been the dominant force number 31 that you see in so many Hamilton games and that may well be because of that newcomer Mark Napolitan the offensive center for the Argos. Watts pass is caught by Paul Pearson. And Pearson is down to the Hamilton 26-yard line. The gain is 22 yards on the completion to Paul Pearson. And I believe that's his first of the afternoon. It is. And it's a big one. Well, most of the time when you blitz somebody, you play man-to-man -man in behind that. That time they blitzed and played a zone coverage. Pearson... He's got the experience. He read it easily and a good throw by J.C. Watts. That's one of the better throws he's made today. Stepped up. Good hard strike. Argos first down at the Hamilton 26. Toronto leads it by three points here late in the third quarter. Watts going deep for Baker. No good. A penalty marker comes down on the newcomer Jim Rockford. There was no doubt about it. He ran right into the receiver. Never once looked for the football. Oh, they ran a pass pattern that I've been waiting to see them run all day. They faked the quick screen to Baker, and all of a sudden he stopped, and then he took off. The newcomer was Defense so sucked in. Forward, pass interference, Hamilton number 26, the first down in the world. Well, there you hear the obvious Four call by Bobby Bryant, but they really fished in the new corner, Jim Rockford, and he had no chance. He had to make the interference. There's no question about this. Call it screening, call it whatever you want. It's called interference. 
And it also puts the ball at the one yard line. And all of this happens with 3.15 left to play in the third quarter. Watts in for the touchdown, his second of the ball game. Well, I don't think there's any question that the Hamilton fans, the Hamilton team, and its coaching staff is shocked by the performance of the Argos here today. Good job by that offensive line. Dan Ferroni, he's the all-star. Why not follow him? Easy, easy ride into the end zone, but the big interference call on Jim Rockford that set up that one-yard touchdown run. Lance Chomick hasn't missed all year and doesn't miss now as the Argos increase their lead to 10 points. Well, it's been a really good performance by that offensive line. We've stressed that this afternoon, and there's not a doubt in my mind that Michigan State graduate Mark Napolitan, who joined the club just about 10 days ago to take over the offensive center spot when Willie Thomas went down, they have done a great job in blocking what is really a ferocious defensive unit of the Hamilton Ticats. You're talking about a group, you know, Chris Schultz has had experience with the Dallas Cowboys for three years. Dan Ferroni's been around six. Dave Kurtzner has been around for nine years. Kelvin Prinster, this is his third year. I mean, these guys are pretty good. Look at the size of Chris Schultz there, number 64. I mean, he's as big as a house. He's a high rise. <laughs> there, there are other factors, too. The turnovers that Toronto have made, four turnovers by Hamilton, only one by the Argos, and penalties. Eight penalties by the Ticats for 80 yards, two for 23 by the Argos. That's funny. Hamilton comes in as the least penalized team, too. Howard Fields from the 23. And Fields again does a great job in getting out over the 45 to the 48. Warren Hudson, number 37, along with Marlon Jones, 90, down to make the stop. And Mike Kerrigan comes back in at quarterback. Yeah, I think this is a good move. You know, for except for a few throws in the first half that he shouldn't have made, Mike Kerrigan had the team moving. You know, he had that 100-yard beautiful drive that Tony Champion scored the touchdown on. Kenny Hobart, he struggled. He had a couple of passes dropped on him early, and I think that affected him. Got champion of DP Pietro to one side, Lee and Stapler to the other as Kerrigan drops straight back. Lux throws over the middle to Lee. A pass was a little bit high, and he couldn't bring it down. Boy, Howland's dropped a lot of footballs today, too, though. Well, you know, I think it all started when they had Howard Fields had that long kickoff return, you'll recall, late in the second quarter. They got down to first and goal from the 11. They ran a reverse to Tony Champion, and they lost yardage. Ever since that, it's been downhill. Second and 10, Ty Cats at their 48. 225 left in the third quarter. Kerrigan throws. That's complete to Di Pietro. There's a penalty marker down on the field. Di Pietro got the ball to the Toronto 43. Now let's wait and see what the marker indicates. Holding against Hamilton. John Malinowski, the right tackle, number 62, is called for holding. Well, there you see him at the right side of your screen. Now they run a stunt, and he has to pick up Mark Seal coming to the outside. Let it run, let it run. Oh, there's no question about that. And he didn't need to grab the jersey there. The ball was going to be thrown, no problem. Ball is pushed back now to the Hamilton 38-yard line. It'll be second and 20. Well, you take away the gain by Rocky in the 10-yard penalty. They lost about 40 yards of offense right there. Triple receivers to the left side of the formation. And that's where Kerrigan is looking and throws, but too far ahead of Di Pietro. But now we've got another penalty marker down. And this one could be a holding call against the Argos in their defensive secondary. Holding, Toronto number 15. Second down and Peter. That's Cliff Hewitt called for holding. Well, you're going to have a chance to look at it. Tony Champion's trying to work his way downfield. And 
You can give him a bump. That's okay, but don't hang on to him like that. You know, that's dumb. You got second and 20. Make the guys earn it. Don't give them the free one. Well, actually, it's still second down. They only get 10 yards on defensive holding, but, you know, you got to make the offensive team work for it. Ball is at the Hamilton 48-yard line. Argos lead by 10. That one again was very nearly picked off. Carl Brazley stepped in front of Rocky Di Pietro. So too did Don Moan. And it may have been the collision between Brazley and Moan that allowed that ball to fall to the turf. Well, of course, that's the illusion sometimes of the zone coverage. What appears to be an opening can close off in a hurry as the two defenders squeeze off that lane, Carl Brazley and Don Moan. So again, Steve Stapler is putting. Well, I'm surprised they haven't gone after him today, Pat. He's yeah. painfully slow getting rid of that football. And Toronto's been more concerned with setting up the returns. He gets them high, but they're seldom very deep. And Brazley does fumble it, but fumbles it out of bounds at the 30-yard line. So that's where the Argos are going to take over with a minute 20 left to play in this third quarter. Just want to remind you that one week from today, it'll be the British Columbia Lions against either the Edmonton Eskimos or the Calgary Stampeders at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time on the full CTV network. With, and Conrad Holloway has come in to quarterback the Toronto Argonauts. Give us to Cedric Metter, and Metter gets a couple of yards. Wrapped up by Mike Walker, the defensive tackle, number 61. Conridge Holloway, as you people are well aware, has not played lately for the Argonauts. Comes into this game, 55% completion percentage on the year. 15 interceptions and only 14 touchdown passes. That's really been the problem area this year. He's usually only about four or five interceptions for the year. He was going deep looking for Chris Woods, but it's kicked up. Lance Shields gives Hamilton possession at the 42-yard line. The pass was well overthrown, intended for Chris Woods. Shields got back to pick it off. Well, the Ticats needed something good to happen to them to try and turn things around. They trail by 10 points. They need a bit of a break. They may have got it here with Lance Shields. The ball just simply well overthrown Chris Woods. Shields turns into a wide receiver himself, makes the interception. But now the offense has got to get something going. Connie was in that play because J.C. Watts is hurt. He has re-injured the thumb of his throwing hand. Happened a couple weeks ago against Ottawa. Kerrigan's pass intended for Tony Champion is incomplete as Champion slipped down. Kerry Parker was providing the defensive coverage. Well, you know things aren't going your way when you throw a good strike out there. At the last second, your receiver falls down. Well, you know what, too, gentlemen? There's a fine drizzle falling now, too. The field's starting to get a little slick. This will be the final play of the third quarter. Kerrigan dumps it off to Zachary. Zachary fumbles the football, but it'll be Hamilton possession, I believe. He'll come up about two yards short of the first down, but boy, does that guy run hard. He appeared to be stopped about the 49-yard line, and he gets it out to the 52. Hamilton will have possession, and they'll have a decision to make when we come back. It is Toronto 24, Hamilton 14, as the third quarter comes to an end. We'll return with the fourth quarter in a moment. On third down, the Ticats don't gamble. Stapler's puck is handled by Brazley, and a no-yards penalty marker comes down. Brazley fumbled the ball, but it really is immaterial because the no yards penalty flag was already down. No yards, 39, Hamilton, up 15, first down. 
That's Ed Gattavakis called for no yards. Just before, well, we went to commercial. Hamilton was really arguing that maybe this fumble should have given them a first down. But watch Willie Pless knocks the ball loose, and actually, I think maybe he was the last guy to touch it before it went out of bounds. So, you know, you argue you should have had a first down. They kind of dodged the bullet not losing the ball. But Argos right now, after that penalty, have possession at their own 45-yard line. Andre Holloway is at quarterback. He throws that center screen looking for Cedric Minter, but the pass goes incomplete. You know, in punting today, Hank Alisic has averaged 45.2, Stapler 31.8. So you can see a lot of yardage made up there. As you look at the three-quarter statistical story, and the turnover picture still is a very big one, 4-2. Hamilton has copped up the ball four times. And then when you take a 14-yard difference every time you punt the football, that makes a lot of yardage, too. Holloway throws to Mitter. He gets to the 50-yard line, and that's about all for a pickup of five. Leo Esrens is there to make the tackle. The ball came loose, but it was after Mitter that hit the ground and the play was dead. Pat, you were talking earlier about Toronto's offensive line. Cedric Minter really agrees with you. He says he's only been here a month, but this is by far the best game the line has played in front of him. And he agrees it's the center that's making a big difference. Well, a lot of times your center's the guy in blitzing situations that has to make the calls. And Mark Napolitan has the experience. Lessig's punt was chased down by Paul Bennett at the 17-yard line. And then he gets to about the 20 or 21. That's about it. So for the umpteenth time today, the Ticats start in a hole as Don Moan was down to make the tackle. A 43-yard punt and only a three-yard return. Watch Don Moan, 36. Now he's a guy that gives you the old 100 percenter every time he puts the helmet on. Boy had a good year, 94 tackles, four sacks for Don Moan, the graduate of the UBC Thunderbirds. First down, tie catch. The ball is just outside their 20. They trail by 10 points here early in the fourth quarter. Pass is caught by Stapler, and he has the first down at about the 37. Daryl Moyer, 24, and Kerry Parker, 17, combine on the tackle after the 15-yard game. I think if I was Mike Kerrigan, that's the area that I would concentrate on here in the fourth quarter. Kerry Parker, because that's that's where they've had their success in all the games this year. Carl Braisley, he's a pretty tough guy. Kerry Parker's the guy I want to pick on. Kerrigan swings it out to the back, Zachary. And Cliff Hewitt drags him down at about the 42. He'll have a pickup of about six yards. But again, you know, that's not a bad gain on first down. No, I think it's a great gain, and you get a good matchup. Ken Zachary, who's 230, working against Cliff Hewitt, who I suspect is about 185, 190. That's the kind of matchup you like in the open field. We've got such a big field to work with, and give it to Ken Zachary. Let him run with it. Second down, about four yards to go. Hamilton, the ball is at their 42-yard line. Well, the pass was intended for Tony Champion, was just a little bit behind him. Kerry Parker was on the defensive coverage, and because the ball was behind him, as he reached back for it, his feet went out from under him. So Chris Woods, 85, is back out onto the field, and let's see if the Argos take a run at Stapler this time. No, nope, Brazley is going to back off now and come as a you know, medium-type punt returner. He's about 12 yards in front. Chris Woods. And this one is a line drive. Bracely takes it over his shoulder at the 28. And ends up losing yardage back to the 25 yard line. Toronto 24, Hamilton 14, 11 minutes, 40 seconds left to play in the fourth quarter. We'll be back in a moment. Great Cup Festival have really done things up well out there again. The kickoff party takes place Wednesday, November the 26th at the Plaza of Nations, which is on the Expo 86 site. And all those things are going to be going on. The annual Great Cup dinner should be a hoot. 
because Rich Little will be there as the main entertainer. The Miss Grey Cup pageant dance takes place on Friday. Board of Trade breakfast on Thursday. A whole lot of things to do if you're going out to Vancouver. And of course, we'll capsulize all those things for you on our pregame show, Grey Cup Day, here on CTV. Argos begin from their 26 yard line. Give us to Cedric Minter. And Minter gets to the 31. He'll have a pickup of five. You know, you start to think about the repercussions from the first game of a two-game total point. Now there's a little more, a little more than 11 minutes remaining, and what a psychological advantage it would be for the Argonauts if they could have a lead going back into their park for the second game. And I'm sure that's what Bob Abilovich is thinking about right now. Yeah, he'd love to have a 17-point lead rather than a 10. He'd like any kind of a lead. You're right, but he knows right now that. They have a shot to pick up some more points here. It would appear that Chris Woods does have the first down, and in fact, they move the yardsticks now. Well, of course, we've mentioned that Toronto did win two out of three games in their series this year, and those two wins did come at Exhibition Stadium in Toronto. So if they can sneak one out here, they'd have to really feel good about their chances. Now, Big Ben, nine years from Georgia, and boy, it's tough trying to make tackles when you're being held. Kelvin Prince's got a horse collar on him. The injured Argonaut is Warren Hudson, the fullback, which means that we'll see Bob Gronk in the lineup, number 34. It really appears as though Warren Hudson has been the guy that they're counting on to play fullback. Bob Gronk, known so much as a good blocker in his career from Queens, has kind of lost his starting job to Warren Hudson. So the Argos pick up the first down on the pass reception and they have it at the 38 yard line. Chris Woods number 85. They have not gone deep to him today which is amazing because he does have that blazing speed. The only time they tried to the pass was intercepted by Lance Shields. This time they're going deep looking for Paul Pearson. There's a penalty marker back in the Argo backfield which would indicate holding by somebody in the holding offense. 69 Toronto. Dan Ferroni number 69 is called for holding. Well he's the right of your screen and kind of tough to see what happens there. Mike or Rod Skillman's trying to get away from him but once you get the hands up on the shoulders of those defensive linemen the officials are going to call it. Ticats push them back inside their 30 at about the 28 and a half yard line so it'll be first and 20 with 10 minutes and 15 seconds left to play there will not be overtime in the event of a tie because this is a total point series Holloway looking for Chris Woods and he's got him deep at the 50 yard line well, that's what we talked about, that they hadn't gone deep to him. He certainly got Shields, and Howard Fields turned around. A 33-yard pickup by Chris Woods. Well, you could see it coming. Connie put all the receivers to the wide side of the field. He had Chris Woods one-on-one -on -one with Lance Shields, and that's the area he chose to try and exploit. He ran a post corner. Post corner, watch that. Turns Lance Shields right around, and pretty good throw. 33 yards later, that's a big play, because, you know, you got second and 20. That's tough to convert. Well, this just doesn't look like the same Argonaut offensive line because they're playing so well today, and there are so many changes in it. I mean, the quarterback is getting nothing but time today, and all season long he didn't get anything. Warren Hudson is back into the ball game. He was the carrier, and he's wrapped up by Ben Zambiazzi virtually at the line of scrimmage. Mitchell Price, number 65, was there to help out. It must be a scary thing when you're a guy like Lance Shields and you're out on the corner you're out on that island by yourself and you know you're one and one with a big big bit of green area to work with out there with Chris Woods and it's got to be scary. I would think you're absolutely right as Dwight Edwards comes into the ball game in place of Paul Pearson. Now the difference there is that Edwards had such blazing speed. The pass to Daryl Smith is caught and he has the first down. It was a saving tackle by Howard Fields. Fields doesn't make the tackle. I can guarantee you that Daryl Smith is in the end zone. That's another area that Toronto has really improved. Their overall team speed. 
Uh, Conrad Holloway reads the blitz perfectly. Paul Bennett, number 27, was cheating up. He was coming. That means you got man to man. You throw it quick, and he got a quick post into Daryl Smith. That's experience by Conrad Holloway reading that defense. 17 yards the game. First down, Toronto at the Hamilton 32. The toss goes to Minter. Nowhere to go. The corner was shut down neatly by Mark Streeter, number 20. You know, it's kind of nice to see a Conrad Holloway get a little time to throw. He just got sandbagged all year long playing quarterback for the Argonauts. Today, he's had a little more protection, and he's been able to complete some passes. Look at the size of that offensive line, though. Now, the way it stands right now, they average 6'5", 260 pounds. It's second down, about 12 yards to go. Minter lost a couple. This one is picked off by Fields. It went right through Cedric Minter's hands. And Fields picked it off. Now Conrich Holloway initially wanted to go to Keith Baker deep. They zoned him up to the short side of the field. No way he could throw it there. You see him looking for Baker. Can't throw it there. He looks back and tip ball. And Howard Fields has an interception. Another break for the Ticats. 747 left to play in the fourth quarter. Toronto 24, Hamilton 14. We'll be back in a moment. Well, let's look at six-year veteran Howard Fields, who picks out that Conrad Holloway pass that Cedric Minter should have caught. But you know, these guys are ball hawks anyway. Mark Streeter had nine interceptions this year. Fields had six. Lance Shields had eight. Les Brown, who's out of the lineup, also had eight. So interceptions are not new to the Hamilton Ticat defense. First down from there, 33. Kerrigan wants to go deep. The champion it's out of bounds. He made the catch, but he was five yards out of bounds. Kerry Parker had good coverage on him. Of course, Kerry Parker said this week, he said, I'm going to give Tony Champion a little more room. I was too aggressive the last time I played him. That time, Champion tried to run an out and up, a deception kind of play, and Parker had no part of it, didn't bite on that out. No way they were going to complete that. Had he been in the field of play, Kerry Parker would have knocked it down for sure. Argos averaged 23 points a game this year, Hamilton 22. So Argos are just a point over what they normally average, and Hamilton is a touchdown under. Kerrigan's pass was very nearly picked off. It was deflected by Don Moan. I talked earlier about the Hamilton linebacking crew and their mobility. The Argos have that as well. Don Moan, David Marshall, Willie Pless, they all get good drops and watch the reaction. Once the ball's in the air, now Don Moan breaks on it. Gets the hand up, knocks it away. Paul Osbaldiston in the kick for the Thai Cats. This one bounces to Chris Rogers at the Toronto 38. Chris Woods, excuse me, with a fine return for the Argos, and they'll have the ball in Hamilton territory. Argos lead at 24 to 14. We'll be back in a moment. The 29-yard punt return by Chris Woods has given Toronto possession in Hamilton territory at the 44-yard line. We've got six minutes and 48 seconds left to play in the fourth quarter. Toronto leads it by 10 points. This is really a critical area now for Hamilton. The Argos have to be stopped at all costs from getting into the end zone because you do not want to go into the other guy's park down by 17 points. Could have been picked off too by Leo Ezrins. It was thrown slightly behind Cedric Metter. Well, Leo broke on the ball just at the right time, intended for Cedric Minter. Of course, Leo was a tight end when he first came up with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He almost had one there. Looks like Dan Ferroni's down, the injured. Toronto Argonaut offensive lineman. He's been kind of nicked all game and struggling back to the huddle every once in a while. Conrich Holloway has thrown eight passes since coming on in relief 
of J.C. Watts. He's completed four for 63 yards, but he's had two intercepted. And of course, a reminder again that next Sunday we'll have the Western Conference Final for you. The B.C. Lions against either the Edmonton Eskimos or the Calgary Stampeders. Who do you like in that game later this afternoon at Edmonton and Calgary? Well, I mean, I, I think you have to take Edmonton. They're at home, and they looked so impressive last week. I know they played Saskatchewan, who are out of everything, but they just look so solid offensively, defensively. They've, they had the opportunity to play in the cold weather on that lousy field, and I think that's going to be a big advantage for them this afternoon. Plus the fact that Gary Allen, the number yeah. one running back in the CFL in 1986, who gained over 1,000 yards, is out of that Calgary attack, and... It makes it a lot harder to throw if you, not, if you never run the football. Well, it sure does, but if there's one guy that impresses me as a gutsy guy, it's that Rick Johnson. And, boy, you know that he'll be giving it everything he can this afternoon. He's got a great receiving core to work with. Dan Peschnick is in, number 65, in place of the injured Dan Ferroni, number 69. It's second down and 10 as Holloway is in the shotgun formation. Again, Howard Fields made the big play on Paul Pearson. There's a penalty marker down. Well, Leo Ezrin's indicates a legal procedure. Procedure, Toronto 64. Well, that's Chris Schultz, number 64, the left tackle. So Hamilton declines the procedure penalty. And Alyssa comes up. Now, this is interesting now for Hank Alyssa. He's 44 yards from the goal line. What do you do? Do you try and pad that lead, or do you just try and hem Hamilton deep in their own territory? I'd go for the point myself. I kind of agree with you right now. Earlier, you know, you went for field position. I'd, I'd maybe air it out now, too. And that's what he does. It's in the end zone. And a penalty marker is down. Marlon Jones, I mean, he looked right at Paul Bennett. And he had to realize he wasn't five yards away. Now, the decision is Hamilton's. Do they want to give up the single point? Or do they want to take the penalty? Number 90, Toronto. <laughs> well, Obi, I don't blame you. He's shaking his head, saying... <laughs> Now just watch this. Well, then it's cagey, you know. He yeah, knows those guys are coming down there, and he waits and waits, and boy, he traps them easily. But, I mean, Marlon has been up here all season now. He knows you've got to get five yards. And the decision is the tie cats. They can, you know, allow the single point to stand and take the ball at the 35, or they can accept the penalty and take it on the 15. Toronto is declined one point. So they'll take the ball at the 35. And give Toronto one more point. It makes it an 11-point lead. That could be a very big point in the overall scheme of things. This is the first game of a total point final series. And I love the format. I think it, it, from a coaching standpoint, boy, you have to really be alert in so many different situations now. Do I give up the point or don't I? You know, it's different from sudden death. Zachary dropped the football. Now they rule it an incompleted pass. And time, of course, meaning everything now. Five minutes and 27 seconds left. Well, the one thing, you know, with this two-game series now, it's, you know, we're not talking desperation now to try and win this game. I mean, obviously, you'd like to win it, but you know that next week you're still going to get to play again. You trail by 11, but that's not insurmountable. Zachary gets by Cliff Hewitt and then is drilled out of bounds by Willie Pless. And he'll be short of the first down. Yeah, it becomes very tough when you're finding yourself second and long, second and long all the time. Earlier in the first half, if you recall, Hamilton was getting great production on first down, and they were putting drives together. Now, a couple of drop balls here and there, and things just aren't going their way. <laughs> there is Obi having a chat with Marlon Jones as he comes off the field. Next time, he'll be about 20 yards from Paul <laughs> Bennett.
Chris Woods takes it on the 33 and dances his way out to the 40-yard line. So with 4.49 left, the Argos are in pretty good shape. They lead this game by 11 points. They've got the football. And we'll remind you that we'll be out in Grey Cup en masse. We'll have the Grey Cup replay of the 1985 game for you on Saturday. And then the Grey Cup parade will come to you live. And on Sunday, we'll have all the pregame festivities. And we'll show you what went on during the Grey Cup week as well so that you can get in the mood for the Grey Cup game. It'll be Hamilton, and Tor Hamilton or Toronto against one of Edmonton, Calgary, and B.C. This is Keith Baker picking up the first down for the Argos out to the 51-yard line. Well, if there's been one play this afternoon that's been successful for the Argonauts, it's certainly been that quick screen to the wide receivers. Both Chris Woods and Keith Baker have had excellent production. It's an easy pass to complete. All you need is that one little block, and, of course, Baker picked up an easy first down there. Again, though, the pressure is really on that Hamilton defense. They cannot allow the Argos to score another touchdown if they want to have a sniff at this championship. Oh, Baker was in a position where he might have made the catch, but he seemed to pull his hands back a little early. Nevertheless, it goes as a long incompletion. Well, he tried to play a little trick on Jim Brockford. Usually, the defensive back watches the hands in the eyes of the receiver, and Baker kept them, kept those hands in until the last second. Tried to shoot them out and make the catch. I thought he was going to make this. So it's second down. Ball is at the Toronto 52 with four minutes left to play in this fourth quarter. High pass from center. And Holloway's pass is picked off once again by Lance Shields. Excuse me, let's make that Streeter. Mark Streeter gives Hamilton the big possession at the 45-yard line of the Argonauts. Oh, what a play he made, too. Holloway did a super job to get away from the rush. He looked like the Conrad Holloway of old. And it looks like a strike deep downfield. Streeter with just great reaction. Of course, he was their leader this year in interceptions. So it's not surprising he makes the big one here. What an interception that is. And what an important one, because now... The Ticats are in a position where they can get on the board. And that's Codridge Holloway down on the turf. Well, you know, he's your sight in 86. He has taken a pounding, but now both teams tied. Each team has had four interceptions this afternoon. I don't know if you call it sloppy offense or good defense. Holloway made the tackle. That's not surprising. Remember the block he threw on James Curry this year in Ottawa on a reverse? Who will ever forget it? And while we're waiting for word on Conrad Holloway, the word on Dan Ferroni is he did dislocate his thumb. Possible fractures, they just tape it up and send him back. Apparently, even if it is fractured, they can put a fiberglass cast on it so he could play next week. He is probably a little uncomfortable, however. Yeah, I would suspect so. Well, tough to use a fork. There's Mark Streeter. Well, Streeter had, as we mentioned earlier, a terrific season. He had nine interceptions in 1986. None any bigger than this one. Well, that tied him for second on the CFL list with Larry Crawford of the BC Lions. Of course, Terry Irvin led the league. Jim Cowan warming up on the sidelines. Of course, they're running out of quarterbacks. J.C. Watts hurt his thumb earlier. Conrad Holloway down on the field now for quite some time. That rule this year, of course, that allows you to dress three quarterbacks really making some sense now as the Argonauts are getting low on quarterbacks. Boy, Connors does not look too healthy there. And what, of course, will drive him nuts, but most of all the coaching staff is that he hurt himself making the tackle. Might have been Dave Kersinger rolling over on him, which didn't help his health condition. Trainer Freddie Dunbar out on the field trying to get him up. Let's have one more peek at what might have happened. There you see Holloway coming from behind. He's going to make the tackle. And as he goes down, yeah, somebody 
wasn't Freud. Conrad just saying to, me, to himself, do I still play with Ottawa or is it Toronto? Oh, Who yeah. is it I play with? Oh, no, yeah. He got uh, looked like the back of the head there. Yeah. So it's first down Hamilton. A good break for the Tie Cats, and they need one, trailing by 11 points. Pass was intended for Tony Champion. It sailed over his head. Again, both clubs using that same play. A little hitch screen. Well, I think you know, there's been a lot of stories today. Of course, the turnovers, the biggest story, but I think the Argonaut quarterbacks quite simply have played better than Hamilton's. Mike Kerrigan briefly was good, but really has not been able to do anything here in the second half. J.C. Watts has a couple of touchdowns rushing. He also threw a touchdown pass. Kerrigan fires down the middle to Rocky Di Pietro, but I don't understand that one because, I mean, he comes up about seven yards short of the first down as Don Moan made the stop. Well, the only thing you can think about is that it is a two-game total point. Yeah. This is, if you don't win this one, I mean, it's not the end of the world, so now he gets a chance at least at a field goal attempt. Toronto 25, Hamilton 14. We'll be back for the final 258 in a moment. saying to himself you know what can happen to us more that didn't happen today I mean they've turned the ball over they've had all kinds of penalties and yet if Paulus Baldiston can kick this field goal they'll only be down by eight points and you can make that up in a hurry in the second game of the total point series and it's good Baldiston connects from 48 yards out. And the Tie Cats have cut the Toronto lead to eight points, 25 to 17. Boy, that's just a huge clutch boot. Conridge, obviously, right out of it. Yeah, you see that day's look, but Paul has Baldiston. What a story he's been, Pat, this year for Hamilton. Kicked that 51 yarder out in Saskatchewan in the overtime tie that they had. They won the game against Ottawa in their final game of the season with a 36-yard field goal. And here, another big kick. And, you know, they thought they were really in deep trouble when Bernie Ruoff got hurt, but this young fellow's really done the job. Well, he played for B.C. and Winnipeg this year prior to Hamilton. He's from the Richmond Raiders of the B.C. Junior Football League. J.C. Watts is back in there to quarterback the Toronto Argonauts. And he's down at the 31-yard line. Frank Robinson covered him there. J.C. has two touchdowns rushing this afternoon and has thrown a touchdown pass. Well, his statistics are not overly impressive this afternoon, but the one thing he's done is he's made the key play. Yeah, he's big got touchdown. him into the end zone. Oh, That's... yeah, big run. and got the, Well, the one run was just a one-yarder, but... Nevertheless, they all count big touchdowns. On that occasion, he lost five yards, so it's second and 15. Going deep for Keith Baker. He's got the ball at the 33-yard line. Oh, that was a great play by J.C. Watts. He rolled out of there, was thinking of running, and then he spotted Baker breaking open at the last second, and he delivers a 48-yard strike. And he was on the run at the left, running left, which is tough. Well, we thought they might test Jim Rockford. We didn't think it would be with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. But Keith Baker easily got in behind him. A good throw by J.C. Watson. Once again, the Argonauts would certainly love to keep running up this score if they can. The ball is at the Hamilton 32-yard line. Watts throws to Chris Woods. And Woods is down inside the 20 to the 19 where Lance Shields and Howard Fields 
28 and 16 combined on the stop. But it's a Toronto first down with the clock stop. A minute 53 left to play in the fourth quarter. They really have got great production out of that play today, haven't they? They sure have. That's absolutely been their bread and butter play all afternoon. But, and you know, it's good they're smart. They keep using it. I mean, keep using it till the other guys can stop it. First down, Toronto. The ball at the Hamilton 19. Cedric Minter. Zig when he should have zagged, and Rod Skillman got a hold of his sweater, hauled him down with help from Frank Robinson. I would be very much surprised if you didn't see Willie Miller in that Argonaut offensive backfield next week. I just think that Miller has more speed than Mitter. Uh, and he would have been in the lineup today, except that he caught the flu this week. Well, the thing with Cedric Minner, you know, of course, you remember from years ago was his pass catching, but they really don't use him that way anymore. So maybe it's not a bad move to get William Miller back in there. That again is Cedric Minner to the 20 yard line. So they'll go for the field goal try here. Leo Esrins was there to make the stop along with Mike Walker, 72 and 61. Lance Chomick will try his second field goal of the afternoon. This one will come from the 27-yard line. And it is good. So with 52 seconds left to play in this fourth quarter, Toronto has increased its lead. It is Toronto 28, Hamilton 17 in the opening game of this two-game total point final. Following today's telecast, the Carlin O'Keefe Sports defensive game star will receive a Royal Canadian Mint one-ounce solid gold coin presented by Tilly, Canadian manufacturers of fine leather goods. At Tilly, they bring together quality and creativity in all their products for all your needs, from their line of personal leather goods through to their travel wear. The Hamilton Ticats have 52 seconds to see if they can get on the scoreboard again. They trail once again by 11 points. Kerrigan's pass is complete to champion. He coughs up the football. And the Argos have recovered at the 29-yard line. They're going to rule that that is a live football. The Argos will have possession at the 27-yard line. David Marshall with the recovery for the Argos. And they have the ball inside the Hamilton 25. Yeah, he has an interception and a fumble recovery now in this game, David Marshall. And Boy, oh boy, you just hate to make mistakes like this. They become so crucial. Tony Champion coughs it up. David Marshall's got it. And 43 seconds left. Toronto just is another great chance to pour it on. And if I'm Obi, I go for the end zone here. I want the touchdown. Because, boy, what a difference that's going to make. And Watts does throw to Paul Pearson. He couldn't hang on coming across to make the hit was Lance Shields. Well, Lance Shields really did make a great play there because that was a good throw by J.C. Watts and Paul Pearson had it in his arms but good timing by Lance Shields knocks it out and oh boy that would have been a great catch. 36 seconds left to play. Toronto 28 Hamilton 17 and the Thai Cats are really in a bind. Argos have the ball at the Hamilton 23. Wide open for the touchdown is Keith Baker. There is a penalty marker down. They are going to rule, I believe, that J.C. was beyond the line of scrimmage. Let's wait. Well, I think he was. I think that's an excellent call, Pat. It appeared as though he crossed the Illegal line of scrimmage. Pass. Number six, Toronto, third down. Well, that's what it was. He was over the line of scrimmage. Let's watch this. The line of scrimmage is the 23-yard line. We'll roll the tape here. We'll see it. 
J.C. does a great job to get away from the pressure. Steps up in the pocket. Now let's see where he releases that football. Let it run. Let it run. Run the. Boy, it's close. Nevertheless, that's also loss of down. So that does bring Lance Chomack into the game. And he will try his third field goal of the ball game from the 30-yard line. And it is good. So with just 24 seconds left to play in the ball game, the Argos have taken a 14-point lead. Toronto 31, Hamilton 17. In this, the opening game of the two-game total point Eastern Final. Well, full marks to the Toronto Argonauts. They've come into a stadium that they have not had great success in the past. And, you know, they've made some errors today, no question about that. But the thing is, Hamilton's made more. And it was amazing. The Ticat fans were really optimistic about this. We spoke to one who said yesterday there was no chance that Toronto could win. And he was a pretty good fan because he was a former quarterback. This is Tony Champion stepping out of bounds. He may have been out of bounds and then come back onto the field of play. That's exactly what happened, Pat. He did step out, and once you go out and come back in, you cannot catch the football. Boy, you're sharp today. Ooh. I was going to say that the ex-player was Dave Marlowe. Illegal substitution, number one Hamilton. He went out of bounds on his own and came back and took part in the play. So that's what happened. Dave Marler, the former Hamilton quarterback, stopped the chat with Leaf and I yesterday. I said, what do you think is going to happen? He said, I just can see no way that Toronto can win. wonder if he sees now. See what former players, they don't know much, <laughs> do they? <laughs> well, Champion was out of the field of play and came back on, so the penalty is 10 yards. Ball is back to the 25. And with 17 seconds left, if I was Hamilton, I might be a little conservative here because down 14 is bad enough. But Kerrigan throws to Jet Tommy. And Tommy gets up to about the 39-yard line with 11 seconds left on the clock. David Marshall made the stop. Second down, Tony Champion makes the catch, wrapped up by Don Moan, short of the first down, with four seconds left to play. Well, the Argos are full value for this victory. Their offensive line really came to the fore. They played extremely well defensively to limit Hamilton to just 17 points. Here's the way the scoring went. It was 7-0 Hamilton at the end of one. Argos led 17-14 at the half, 24-14 at the end of three quarters of play and they appear to be going to win it 31 to 17 with this the final play coming up Patrick the word on Conrad Holloway minor concussion not for the first time this season no you're right there well I'll guarantee you there'll be a war next Sunday in Toronto because Hamilton is just they'll be wild next Sunday and that offensive line that we've spoken so much about today, they better be at their best next week because Hamilton will just tie the chin straps on and come after them. Well, there's Conrad Holloway on the sidelines with Dan Ferroni. Dan Ferroni's had a tough day, too. He is really beat up and battered, but boy, he stays in that lineup game after game. Interesting, though, coming into this, you know, you'd think Ticat defense, they are tough. Toronto's played well against that defense today. This should be the final play of the ball game. And the final pass is picked off. Daryl Moyer makes his third interception of the afternoon. As the Toronto Argonauts win this one by 14 points, and what a victory it is for them. The final, Toronto 31. Hamilton 17 will be back in just a moment. Wake up. And the defensive game stars of the 16. And now the Carling O'Keefe Sports offensive and defensive game stars is selected by our broadcast crew. 
from the Toronto Argonauts quarterback J.C. Watts with two touchdown runs and a touchdown pass offensive star His teammate defensive back Daryl Moyer three interceptions today defensive star each of today's stars will receive a Royal Canadian Mint one ounce solid gold coin presented by Remington products makers of the 3M surgical clippers and the micro screen rechargeable advanced shaving technology only from Remington and by Tilly bringing together quality and creativity in all their products from the line of personal leather goods through to their travel wear this is the CFL playoffs on CTV the Argonauts win today 31 17 they will have a 14 point lead when game two starts next week in Toronto next telecast on CTV will be the Western final next Sunday November 23rd the BC Lions meet either Edmonton or Calgary this program is copyrighted and is strictly intended for the private use of our audience. Any reproduction, retransmission, or rebroadcast without the express written consent of the CTV television network is strictly prohibited. This is the CTV television network.